Are we? Tell me when we'll go. Okay. I'd just like to call this meeting to order. I will. Uh, in order to call attendance, I will now conduct roll call by calling each counselor's name. Counselors, when I call your name, please say here. Counselor Baggy. Here. Counselor Beauregard. Here. Counselor Bodner. Here. Counselor Bruno. Here. Counselor Danch. Here. Counselor Demeray. Here. Counselor Clayla. Here. And Counselor Well. Here. Thank you, counselors. I'll now get into my mayor's report. Good evening and welcome to our second virtual council meeting. I'm here in the council chambers with our CAO, Scott Louie, Clerk Amber Lapointe, Deputy Clerk Charlotte Madden, and a member of WeStream who are live streaming this meeting for us. I'd like to welcome our eight city councillors and various city directors who are each attending from home. City Hall and almost all of our facilities remain closed to the public. Staff have been working with members of our Emergency Operations Center on recovery plans for a safe and gradual reopening once we get the go-ahead for the province of Ontario and our Emergency Operations Center determines that it is safe to open our facilities to staff and members of the public. In the meantime, we will continue to find new ways to deliver services for you. We ask for your patience while we all work together for a safe and gradual return of services. I know these times are trying on everyone, and recently there were some attacks on social media against our bylaw enforcement officers who are out in the community trying to enforce the provincial orders. Our staff deserve respect, and I ask that you allow them to do their jobs in a respectful manner. Late last week, the city of Port Colborne um, was told that we have an anonymous grocery donor and they are set sail, uh, setting sail into Port Colborne. The residents of Port Colborne will be the next beneficiary of Niagara's anonymous grocery donor on Wednesday, May the 27th from 1 to 3.30 p.m. when the next truckload of free groceries will be unloaded in the Valley Health and Wellness Center parking lot. All are welcome to come to the Valley Health and Wellness Center to receive free groceries while quantities last. Staff and volunteers from the City of Port Colborne and Port Cares will be on hand to assist in distributing the groceries. Items will be distributed following the best practices outlined by the Niagara Region Public Health to limit the spread of COVID-19. These include physical distancing, use of hand wash stations, sanitation of hands, or sorry, sanitization of hands, and all volunteers will be wearing personal protective equipment. Those attending who have face coverings are also asked to wear them while picking up the food. Since the Port Colborne Community Bus is currently not, op not operating due to COVID-19, city staff are currently coordinating a bus route for residents who require transportation to the Valley Health and Wellness Center. Route details will be available within the next day. This donation comes at a time of need when individuals and families across Niagara are struggling with financial concerns amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Anonymous food donations have already been made in St. Catharines, Welland, Thorold, and Niagara Falls. For city COVID-19 updates, we ask you to visit www.portcolburn.ca backslash page backslash COVID-19. As the provincial government entered phase one of its recovery plan, some residents were lifted, sorry, some restrictions were lifted allowing our municipality to reopen some amenities. Our boat launch reopened, but not our marina or docks. Our tennis, pickleball courts reopened, however, washrooms have not. The Elm Street leash-free dog park is now open, which is operated by the region of Niagara. Our beaches continue to be open for passive use only, meaning you can walk the beach, not sit on the beach. Parks remain open for passive use only. Last Friday, we expanded some of the amenities, including in passive use in our parks to include shoreline fishing, including H.H. Knoll Lakeview Park, bringing a chair or blanket to relax in the parks, kick and ball, playing catch, flying a kite, and other such activities with members of your own household. Use of basketball and soccer nets within the parks with members of your own household at community parks, excluding the Valley Health and Wellness Center, TA Land and Sports Complex. 
Individual activities such as yoga or exercising provided not in a group or class. All this while still abiding by restrictions limiting groups to no more than five people. Anyone taking advantage of these spaces are to follow the best practices as outlined by Niagara Region Public Health to limit the spread of COVID-19 in our community. These include frequent washing, sanitizing of hands, physical separation, avoid touching of shared services, and staying home if displaying symptoms or having been in contact with cases of the virus. Organized sports are still restricted on municipal fields given their necessity for gathering in groups. At this time, park and outdoor amenities such as playground equipment, benches, outdoor fitness equipment, municipal beaches, washroom facilities, and the Algoport Skate Park and BMX Park will remain closed. By law enforcement will continue to enforce gatherings larger than five people, dogs off leash, and anyone using closed park amenities. This week, Niagara Region and the mayors of the 12 municipalities sent a letter to Ministers of Finance for the province of Ontario and the Government of Canada, outlining the financial impact of COVID-19 on Niagara area municipalities. We have offered six recommendations for financial relief and look forward to their response. The sustainability of our municipal operations is of the utmost importance as we continue to bring essential services to our residents and businesses. The mayors and CAOs in the region continue to hold weekly teleconferences to discuss issues related to COVID-19 in our communities and how we are dealing with them. The mayors of Welland, Thorold and myself continue to speak with MP Badaway on a weekly basis as he keeps us apprised of developments and assistance offered by the federal government. Our economic development officer, Julian Douglas Kameka, has been meeting with her colleagues in the region as well as businesses in Port Colborne and are developing a regional economic recovery plan. Julian also continues to meet with local businesses via virtual meetings to assist with individual recovery business plans. In order to assist with curbside deliveries, beginning last week, city staff started installing 15-minute curbside pickup zones. This is temporary signage in the downtown core for residents and visitors supporting local businesses to use. Since Main Street has no on-street parking, curbside pickup locations have been created in parking lots along Main Street. Please watch for these signs when parking and be mindful they are to help your local business. Residents and visitors interested in supporting local businesses are also encouraged to visit resilient.portcolburn.ca to learn which Port Colburn businesses are open and how they are adapting services. Port Colburn businesses are also encouraged to visit the website to add their business and service offer offerings. We have heard from several restaurant owners requesting the creation or expansion of outdoor patios once restaurants and bars are allowed to open. We have also heard uh, that many are facing significant red tape from the AGCO with respect to these temporary license expansion requests. We urge the provincial government to ease some of these restrictions, but also let the municipalities administer their bylaws and work with the businesses to find appropriate places for these expanded patios. Last week, I wrote to Mayor Tory of the City of Toronto because he's been a leader uh, in that area with regards to dealing with the province and the ACGO with regards to Toronto patios. So we want to have a uh, united voice here in Niagara. The 12 mayors and the regional chair all back this idea that was brought forward from uh, Mayor Galini and Mayor Campion of Welland and myself. So we'll be creating a letter once we receive more information from the City of Toronto to send to uh, the minister in charge in, uh, in Toronto at Queen's Park. Last week, Niagara Region Public Health released COVID-19 statistics as they relate to each municipality. They can be viewed on the Niagara Region website at their COVID-19 link. Statistics for Port Colman remain very low with only one active case as of last Friday, but we need to remain focused on proper precautions. Earlier this month, city officials met with staff from Geo Railways who operate our rail system the St. Lawrence Seaway Management Corporation, and Niagara Regional Fleet to further discuss the issue of ATVs and off-road motorcycles on private and city property. We are developing a plan of improved signage, restricted air access, and increased enforcement to deal with these individuals as they continue to access private and public property. We ask that you continue to report violators to our bylaw enforcement office via email at bylawenforcement at portcolburn.ca. That's bylaw enforcement at portcolburn.ca or by calling 905 835 2900 extension 207. 
In closing, we must remain vigilant in fighting this virus. Our number one priority of our citizens as we begin a safe and gradual reopening of services and business activities. Please stay safe. We will now have our regional counselor, Councillor Butters, uh, provide our region update. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate being here and joining you all. So I'm going to be quick as I can. Uh, I think probably one of the more most important things that um, got released last week was the municipal information on uh, COVID virus um, and, and uh, per municipality. Um, I think a lot of people were asking for that and so personally I was glad to see that finally come forward. So as of today's date in a regional sense, um, there has been a total case cases of 633 across the region, 81 active cases, 494 results and there has been 58 deaths. Two new cases today which translates into 144 days to double at that current rate and, uh, and that double um, the days to double is a really important number because the higher that number gets, uh, the better off we all are. Uh, I think I was really impressed with Port Coburn's um, low numbers, but to keep them low, we must be absolutely vigilant about social distancing, hand washing, wear a mask if you, if you don't think you can socially distance. All those things are gonna help us um, stay safe and keep our neighbors and our families safe. Uh, the other thing that's going on this week is, uh, last week was uh, Nurses Appreciation Week. This week is uh, the Paramedic Services um, Appreciation Week. And so last night, that was, uh, the celebrations are virtually kicked off by um, actually Niagara Falls, uh, lit up the falls in Omaha Orange in celebration of um, Paramedics Week. So all through the week, there's uh, virtual celebrations going on that honors um, the work that they do and as a frontline worker, I think that we all are very appreciative of what they face each and every day and, and wish them well as they go forward and, and to stay safe and to stay healthy. Uh, another um, bit of news, uh, just in the last day or so, uh, you can now self-refer to the assessment, um, the COVID testing clinics in St. Catharines and Niagara Falls. Previously, you had to be sent sent there. Now you can actually call ahead for an appointment if you think you've been exposed or you want to get tested. They will take walk-ins, but of course, if you do that, then the wait will be much longer. Um, for an appointment, you can call 905-378-4647, extension 42819. Um, for those, uh, for those that wish to do that, they're open from nine to five, Monday to Sunday. And as a side note, 9,400 people have been uh, seen since opening in March. Uh, the, the last few, the last um, standing committees really focused around the COVID-19 um, impacts and what the, and how we're handling that. Of course, the, the business of the region continues. So contracts are being signed and tenders are being done but really the a huge focus has been the impact of COVID-19 um, on how we do things and how to do it safely. So with that, I will, um, I'm available for questions and I'm glad to see you all stay safe and stay healthy. Great, thank you, Councillor Butters. Councillors, any question to the regional councillor? I have Councillor Bruno. Thank you, Worship, thank you. Uh... Uh, Barb, for coming out tonight under these circumstances on Zoom. Um, just had two questions. One was regards to um, the large item pickup. I think what we're concerned about is that, um, I know Councillor Danch brought it up, a lot of these folks that put stuff out, the large item pickup got stopped, and then now I understand it's back on. So I'm just wondering if you happen to have the number there handy because I don't. And also, I don't know if the city could call in on some of those folks that have left it out now for four weeks and might not get the news that it's open. 
Sure. Thanks, Councillor Bruno. I appreciate it. Um, you can, uh, people can either go online and fill out a, um, a request form, and they would do that at niagararegion.ca slash waste, or they can phone 905-227-7771, and the toll-free number is one 855 Two two seven 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 one, and you should do this at least two days before your uh, register collection day to make those arrangements. So definitely, if you have big stuff to pick up, please go that route and just don't leave it on the side of the road because it just looks ugly. Thanks, Barb. Uh, just one other. Uh, I was going to Welland the other day, and I took Elm Street and decided to wheel in the dog park there when they had slid the sawhorse across but it was back open but the sign out front is seen uh it looks like it's uh, it's green rather than natural stone from aphids and moss and everything else i'm wondering if they could clean that up the the road interior is uh cratered and needs a, uh, a uh, some stone or some grating uh and the uh there's and that pavilion out there looks like the uh, either dirt bikes or somebody's been scattering stones all over. It needs a good, uh, it needs a good end-to-end -end cleanup that someone could, uh, if you could get somebody out there now that it's open. Uh, consider it done, sir. Good. Thank you. Thank You're you, welcome. Councilor Bruno. Uh, Councilor Beauregard. Hi, Councilor Butters, and thanks Hi. for your report. Uh, I just have a question. I'm not sure if you're if you know the answer to this one, but is is the test that's being used for COVID at our uh, testing facilities? Is it still that unpleasant test where they put that large swab up your nose? Uh, I, I believe it is. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Any other counselor? Seeing none. Again, Barb, appreciate it. Thank you very much for no problem. this evening. And uh, again, counselors, anytime you need an issue, you can either come through Barb or myself, and we'll make sure that uh, our staff at the region look after your concerns. Again, thank you. Now we're gonna go on to the introduction of addendum items. Madam Clerk, are there any addendum items this evening? There are no addendum items this evening. Next, I'll be calling uh, for a vote. Uh, this will be moved by Councillor Danch and uh, seconded by Councillor Bruno. The council waived the rules of the procedural bylaw for all of electronic meetings in order to add councillors' items after item nine on the agenda. Anybody have a question to that? It's more of a procedural um, vote, what we're doing. Seeing no questions, if everybody could raise their hand in favor. Anyone opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Confirmation of the agenda. I have a mover, Councillor Bodner, a seconder, Councillor Wells. Does anyone have a question with regards to the agenda this evening? Seeing none, please raise your hand in favor. That's carried unanimously. Disclosures of interest. The following councillors have declared a conflict of interest. Councillor Wells has declared a conflict of interest on items 2, 7, and 13. Councillor Beauregard has declared a conflict of interest on items 1, 2, and 6. Councillor Bodner has declared a conflict of interest on item 1. Councillor Danch has declared a conflict of interest on item 7. Any further conflicts, councillors? Councillor Beauregard. I'll include a conflict on item seven as well. Okay, Madam Clerk, you're fine with that? Okay, seeing no others. Thank you. Adoption of minutes. Moved by Councillor Baggy, seconded by Councillor Clayla. Anybody have a question on the minutes of uh, council from 10 or council of sorry, the regular meeting of council, 10-20, held on April the 27th, 2020. Any questions on that? Seeing none, all in favor? 
Raise your hand. That's unanimous. Determination of items requiring separate discussion. So far, Council has sent in items number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten, eleven, and thirteen. Any further items, Council? Seeing none, approval of items not requiring separate discussion. Mover is Councillor Beauregard, seconder is Councillor Demeray. All those in favour, please raise their hand. That is unanimous. Thank you. Consideration of items requiring separate discussion. We will begin with item number one, Fire and Emergency Services Department Report 2020-35, subject, open burning bylaw. Mover is Councillor Danch, seconder is Councillor Wells. For those that wish to speak to this, please raise your hand. Danch, pretty much everyone. Okay. Rogers out, Beauregard's out, and Mark Beauregard. Okay, I'll move to Councillor Danch uh, for the first question. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thanks, Chief, for showing up. This has been a long uh, ongoing battle between uh, your department and the, uh, you know, us and the community is, and uh, whoever else is out there. Um, and not just because the COVID is going on, it's that time of year when people and their families get together and just try to enjoy, enjoy the outdoors. Um, I've read your explanation and uh, your career and all that kind of stuff and we've got communities like Wayne Fleet that allow burning with a permit we have Pelham which is a lot denser community than Wayne Fleet with a permit you you talk about staff time false alarms and all kinds of stuff one of the problems and I understand lies with your neighbor and I really think this is a time to maybe talk to your neighbor invite them over tell them what you're doing to say that false alarms are an issue you guys are chasing false alarms all the time that's what you're there for um staff time an hour to fill something out I I don't believe that um we use Google Maps to check out people's homes. That's how different departments check on different things. Um, once again, there's no big time loss there. You, you talk about the firefighters being at a call and having to call the volunteers in. I was one for 15 years. That's why we're there. Um, we are volunteers and we go when the bell rings. It's not fair to let someone that comes into our community, sometimes on a weekend or a four day or a summertime visit, to some of the trailer parks in the community where they're a lot closer together than we would ever be in our homes and to allow them to burn safely, cautiously in a respectful way. I don't get it. I live in this community 12 months a year. I've been here longer than you for sure. What's wrong with a little hot dogs with your children, grandchildren, whoever, your guy, your buddy next door? We, we've battled this for so long. 
I think it's time. We always look for ways to generate funds. There you go. You've got a permit available to you. You can charge for this. An hour is ridiculous. Name, address, phone number, where you live, Google Maps. Hey, you got a lot that's 150 feet wide. You got a lot that's 60 feet wide. You've got no outbuildings on your property. There's been no fires caused to property from an outside fire. I know you're going to batter me back on this. I really don't care. You show chimneys or backyard burning things. It was so nice that you used home hardware SKU numbers. I'm not here to sell fireplaces. I don't sell fireplaces. There's none in my store. But we need to back off a little bit. Let these people have a pack of hot dogs or some marshmallows and s'mores and let people enjoy their backyards with a responsible fire in your backyard. I, I've said it three, four times now. I know everybody's got their hands up. So everybody, I want you to jump in on this one. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And, and there wasn't a question there, but if we can take questions first and then we'll go to comments. Uh, next, I have Councillor Bruno. Thank you, Worship. Uh, just with respect to, uh, I guess it would be option two, but I'm seeing really option four. Uh, Chief, there's the issue of, I think the one that probably is the most uh, discretionary one, if an officer were to be looking at it, and that is the issue of smoke. So one could say that that's uh, sometimes in the eye of the um, beholder, the eye of, or the nose of the, uh, of the complainant. But what I'm concerned is, is when we're all home, tucked in bed, or having a good time, and your officer is out there with either of the um, option two or option four, and they are left with deciding whether the smoke is going into the neighbor's window or two neighbors down or whoever complained, I don't really want to, to leave that person A, high and dry, or B, get a phone call the next day because it was or wasn't dealt with um, in the way the complainant uh, wanted it dealt with. So I'm about trying to empower yet uh, have a system that is as best possible one-stop decision making. And so I want to ask you, uh, because with option four, when it goes to smoke conditions, and I just want to read this one section here. Uh, the underlying issue, a complaint concerning smoke affecting others' lifestyle. There is no real way to track the travel of smoke and the effect it has on others. Should council wish to modify the existing burning bylaw as proposed under option number four of this report, the fire department representative would be unable to make that determination unless it is blatantly obvious either by strong winds or products being burned. So I'm wondering uh, if you could explain um, any of the uh, the issues surrounding surrounding an officer being empowered to make that determination. I mean, there's many times when a police officer, uh, a bylaw officer, uh, people have to make a call, whether it's at the border, it's discretionary. I would like to leave that in the hands of the officer, not to take it off anybody's back, but to settle the issue for that evening and to settle the issue when a response is warranted the next day by either again, someone calling your department, calling <laughs> a counselor, calling the mayor, calling the CAO, that it didn't go down the way they thought. I mean, I think their concern hopefully is real 
and not uh, the neighbor issue that can sometimes happen. So I'm looking to see if there's anything uh, anything wrong with leaving that to the discretion of the fire officer. Thank you. Chief Cartwright. Uh, through your worship, the Council Bruno. Uh, Councilor, thank you for calling me today and discussing various issues with regards to this particular report. I appreciate that. Uh, hopefully I was able to explain some of those issues. The, uh, the What I can say is that up until this point in time, we, we tried to take that away from the officers because there's always criticism no matter which way you go. So it, in past years, what we've done is said, if we get a complaint, we put it out. I've written the, the option number four uh, to make sure whoever has a fire, they do it safely. And if we were to show up, uh, the officer in charge, whether it be myself, the fire prevention officer, the deputy chief or the captain, whoever that might be, uh, shows up, they would have the discretion to be able to say, there's nothing obvious to me, there's no reason why this fire can't continue. And they would literally walk away from it and report back uh, through the call process that it was allowed to burn because it met the requirements of the revised bylaw. Councilor Bruno. So I guess I'm more concerned with, um, well, I guess what I'm reading in what in the in the state in the um, in the report was the non-discretion. Or sorry, the the issue that if it's real windy, sure, but if it's not windy, it, but it's still apparent to the officer having investigated it, he could still stop the fire. So in other words, he has that discretion. He has some discretion. Chief Cartwright? Yeah, through your worship, uh, that's correct, Councilor Bruno. If, if number four was to be adopted by council, uh, quite obviously the officers would, we talk to the officers, we go through the processes we do with all of our bylaws to make sure they had a good understanding of it. They would go to make sure it was, uh, it was burning properly. They didn't have uh, products that were causing issues. And if they found it to be safe, uh, I, I would trust that their discretion would be to allow it to continue to burn. The other side of that, of course, if they found that it weren't to be a clean burn, they would ask the person to put it out or we would put it out. Uh, and the same thing would hold true with a permit. Uh, obviously, if permits are issued, uh, yes, you can have a permit, but if it's a smoky fire, guess what? You're gonna to be told to put it out. Councillor? Thank you, Chief. Uh, you know what? I, I, other councillors should have their fair shake. I, I like number four because I'm not a fan of, of uh, increasing permits, cost recovery, more paperwork, the onus on us, the onus on us after the fact to uh, when you're driving down the road to see a fire and now you're stopping in on it. I think the onus should be on the homeowner. I'd like to see a little bit of an education program first. I'd like to see uh, it go through the COVID committee to at least in the interim, what the impact would be with a short porch on having to report back and get this to a vote. But uh, I'm just really concerned that at the end of the day, when we send someone out there and they're there making that call that we have to respect the authenticity, the integrity of the officer. Because every time there's an enforcement, there's always going to be a group or a reaction. And in this one, something like smoke, it can, I can just see the no, it isn't. Yes, it is. It's still the neighbor doing it, but it wasn't really that wind. And the wind just shifted in the last 20 minutes since I called and all that stuff. So I, I just think that whatever we decide, we have to just stand behind it and uh, let the officers do their job. But that's all I have now, Mr. Merritt. Thank you, Councillor Bruno. I know the CAO has a comment to make with one of your comments. Yeah, so through the mayor to Councillor Bruno, I appreciate your consideration of the, the city's response to the pandemic as it pertains to this issue. And I think if I understand the implication, it's that um, we've, as we consider reopening or, or the first time around the closing of facilities, we've sort of um, considered the impact of the precautions or the use of a facility 
on emergency services. And so the city runs four platoons of three firefighters on a full-time basis, as well as around 30 volunteer firefighters. And one of the things we were trying to avoid from the very start, along with ambulance and along with uh, police, is keeping those staff out of, um, I guess, unsafe situations vis-a-vis -vis the spread of the virus. So I can take this back to that committee. We're meeting three or more times a week at the moment, but it would impact the speed with, like, I mean, it could be Wednesday, but uh, if, if council wants a decision tonight, that discussion won't be able to take place. Having said that, the firefighters do have precautions in place for when they're in close proximity to callers, you know, whether it's a car accident, a fire, a, you know, a, a false alarm and so on. We have the protective equipment for the firefighters to make sure that they're protected. Okay, Councillor Bruno. Yes, I think that what I want to do is just not elongate this pro process that's gone on a long time in getting to tonight. I mean, I don't mind dealing with um, a decision tonight. I, I don't like the idea of we have COVID, we're in the middle of COVID, we have a COVID committee, it meets three times a day, it's, it's learned a lot. I, I don't want to not hear what they have to say. Yeah, three, so time, I, three times a week, Councillor. Well, I, you know, I don't know if we can, you know, get it on the next agenda or, or sooner, but, but, but something, um, that voice needs to be heard. I'm not a health expert or a health and safety expert and, and COVID is beyond my pay grade. So I would hate to adopt something and then not have run it by a committee specifically set up that has expertise on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. So, Councillor, depending on which option we actually move forward with tonight, if the bylaw needs to be changed, that'll actually be brought back next meeting. So there is time between now and our next council meeting to have the EOC, which meets three times a week, to vet this with any uh, concerns with regards. But as, as the CAO said, the fire department does have protocols in order already with regards to COVID on any call they receive. So those protocols would still be uh, followed, obviously, in a case of a backyard fire. No different than today. So if, if somebody was having a fire in their backyard tonight, the neighbor called, the fire department attends. Whether this is passed or, or not, and in, in what option we take, those precautions are already there. But, but the CAO can put it on, depending on what option we take, and bring that forward to the next EOC meeting. Is that fine? Yes, I mean, given you're telling me it's got to, it, if it's dealt with tonight, it's got to come back anyways in two weeks. I'm fine with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, I have Councillor Demeray. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't have any questions, but I do have some comments. Uh, did you want me to wait until after the questions? Yeah, let me, are can done? I get three questions first, councillors? Okay. Okay. Uh, questions then next is Councillor Wells. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I have three questions, two of them to uh, uh, Chief Cartwright and one to Dan Aquilina. I'll start with Dan Aquilina. The question is, is that on the, the report on, uh, I believe it's page five of the report or page 15 of the package, uh, section 2.2B refers to schedule A of the official plan. If you refer to schedule A of the official plan, it is a, a, a drawing showing the various zones um, and uses within uh, the city of Port Coburn. Is that correct, Dan? Mr. Aquilino? Mr. Mayor, through you to Councillor Wells. What, what I would want to do is actually find that section and find the map just to confirm the comments to go back to yourself and Council. Just give me some time here. I'll, I'll find that and I'll report back once I have that information. So I would suggest you continue on. If I can, Your, your Worship, just to Dan so he doesn't spend too much time with that is that my concern is that when I viewed the Schedule A, uh, Schedule A only includes the Shirkston Resort campgrounds. There are no other campgrounds within Port Coburn identified on that schedule. So Dan, you might wanna uh, qualify or confirm that 
And if that's the case, then we may need to change schedule A or our official plan. And we'll have to go through that whole process in order to include the other campgrounds. So that was the one concern that I had in regards to uh, allowing um, uh, an exception according to schedule A. And just to confirm that schedule A is there's no wording, there's no, uh, there's nothing in that that other than the map. Okay, so if we can have uh, Mr. Aquilina come back to us once he finds that information, just to confirm that. Uh, your next question, Harry. Uh, the next uh, two questions are are to uh, Chief Cartwright. Uh, Chief, why would a campground be excluded uh, when a homeowner wouldn't? Chief, uh, through your worship, uh, Councillor Wells. Uh, quite frankly, the bylaw that you have and we've been enforcing has been in place well before I got here. 1984, I believe, was when it was it was brought through council initially. Uh, there's been very minor changes made to it over those numbers of years. Uh, I wasn't here in 1984, and I'm not in a position to answer why Shirkson. I'm assuming it's different because it is a relatively large resort that uh, obviously camping goes with recreational uh, vehicles, trailers, and such. So I'm assuming that's where it came from. I can't answer as to how it got to that point in time. It was before my time. Thank you. Councillor Wells. Uh, thank you, Chief. Uh, the other question uh, was in regards to um, best practices. Have, uh, have you or any of your staff reviewed all the best practices that are, or the best, if you will, the best uh, bylaws that are in place in the other communities that are allowing uh, campfires in the backgrounds and can we utilize those as a source to identify our best practices which could be accumulation of all of those other best practices to be put in place uh, in into our uh, policies if we go forward to allow them chief cartwright you know, your worship through you to councillor wells all i can say is that we are roughly equal 50 50 across the board between permits required and no permits required um, it was earlier mentioned about Pelham and Waynefleet. Obviously, uh, the Waynefleet is a lot of agricultural burns. Uh, I do know that uh, uh, Lincoln allows for agricultural burns. Uh, they don't permit uh, fires in the urban area. I will tell you that uh, uh, option number four, Mears Welland, our closest neighbor. Uh, I did speak to the chief this afternoon again after speaking to Councillor uh, but, I'm sorry, Councillor Bruno, with regards to the distance, because the distance that I had used mirrored a, a number of being five meters, which is referred to earlier in the bylaw, the existing bylaw. So I went with what's already existing. I can tell you uh, that uh, the distance uh, between what we have and what Welland has is uh, their distance is three meters to a property line or anything that is combustible. Additionally, they require 15 foot overhead clearance. Uh, from trees and, and things like that. Uh, other than that, the bio, uh, option number four mirrors exactly what Welland has. I will also tell you that Welland runs about uh, 100 burning complaints a year or so, depending on the summer. The, um, the, the fire uh, information I provided within option four is basically identical to what uh, Welland uses in speaking to Brian Kennedy, the chief, this afternoon. Uh, and, and they respond the same as what we would respond under that option. If their captain gets there and determines that the fire is safe, it meets the requirements of the bylaw, uh, they, they walk away and allow it to continue. Councillor Wells? That's it for my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Clayla. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I've got a couple questions too for the Chief. You say you've talked with um, the different communities. I guess I, I looked at Pelham's because I'm familiar with their bylaw. And um, as Councillor Danch said, they have built up urban area. And I know that they charge $50 as initial assessment for a permit. And then they go out and they just one person goes, you don't even have to be there. You have a list of the rules. They go out and they look at it and you're issued your, your permit. And that's the end of it, basically. If there's a complaint made and they come out and you're, you you contravene the rules, that you lose your permit. You don't get permit for the next year. If there's no problems, if you've, there's been no complaints, the next year they don't even visit. For $20, your, your permit is renewed. And, and there is a bit of paperwork, but at the same time, 
they alleviate a lot of the calls simply because when people call in to complain, there's this list of who has permits, and then that way they don't even have to attend the fire. They explain to the neighbor that, that they have a permit. If the neighbor still insists that there's, there's something, a rule is being broken, they do go out and attend the fire and they make the judgment at that point. But at least it's an enforceable bylaw. We keep saying, oh, don't make a bylaw, just let them do what they want. But we saw what happened last year, people pulling out stakes and pretending to cook and all these different things. And, you know, you've mentioned COVID-19. I heard it mentioned a couple of times. I look at the psychological effects of, what, of what's going on and how we've taken so much away from people. This is an opportunity for families to spend time with their children, to be with their families, to, even to say neighbours over the fence, like Councillor Dench said, you know, get to know your neighbours. It's not about having big, huge fires. It's like, what did, what did we say, 6 to 11? But I don't think it should be without a bylaw. People that I've spoken to don't mind the idea of paying a fee, of, of having a set of rules, of knowing what's expected of them, and there's an accountability for it. I have a porch, and a, the, the chief himself knows. I, I have a small uh, propane one, which I asked if that was okay to have. The nice part about this is it's a teachable moment. If you get families who are applying for putting applications in that aren't allowed because of the dimensions of their properties, it's a perfect opportunity for the firefighters to say to them, you know, this isn't really, you can't have a fire because of these particular reasons, but instead maybe you could go with a propane. They can give them solutions. They can work together as a community. I have one, um, and Mark knows this, we have one constituent very, very upset with her neighbor because they have fires. But every time the fire department goes there, they're cooking hot dogs. But it's too close to her house. But if we had rules in effect and we knew, you know, that it wouldn't be located there. And, and I think that there's room for talking to people versus just saying, you know, well, we'll just go with what we've been doing. What we've been doing doesn't work. It's Counselor, very do you have, obvious Counselor, it doesn't work. Do, uh, we're looking for questions right now. Comments are well, coming I, up. I guess so I'm just looking questions? at the chief. And I've read, I read the chief's whole thing, and I really thank you for all the work that went into it. But, but I guess I'm looking for a solution. You know, and I see, I understand all the things that you say, but I see a very negative report. And I want, I want to look at solutions that we can work with and to me, this is the perfect time for moving forward with what's going on. I don't know, do you see, Chief, you know, I, I know you've told us many times how many how many calls come in. Um, do you not see this as a way to be able to to alleviate some of that to the fire department? If, if, if you know that a call is coming in and, you know, you're able to say to that person making the call, we will come, but, but they do have a permit. So you better be sure that they're, you know, are they really doing something that's outside of that? Or does that put too much burden on the fire department? Chief Cartwright? So through your worship, uh, the council as a whole, I'll, I'll, I'll address it as best I can. Um, obviously, some municipalities do permits, um, and there's various ways of doing it, similar to what you may have described, but there's other areas that you can do it too. Quite frankly, I'm, I'm really not in favor of Google search. I don't find it accurate in our research. They don't seem to be overly accurate in some cases. I have concerns about that. I believe it does require a site visit, as you've already said. Mm -hmm. uh, with regards to your comment about us going and not putting it out and, and being too close, I, I'm not going to argue with you, but I would find that challenging simply because our people are told that if they get a complaint, it has to be put out, hot dogs or not. Uh, so I, I think that the way the current bylaw is being enforced is somewhat different than maybe what you have described it or, or something you've been misinformed. I'm not really sure of that. Uh, but I'm talking about changing the, the bylaw. I'm not, what, I'm not talking about what's there, Chief. I'm talking about you coming up with the dimensions. I'm asking you and the bylaw officers to actually determine all of the measurements that need to be. So then that get, that's given to everybody when they get their permit so they then know what the rules are. So that when, when somebody calls in on them, if they're following the rules, it's, it's fine. If they're not following the rules, they lose their permit. It, it's, a, it's called accountability. People, making people accountable for their actions and what they're doing when they're having fires. Chief Cartwright, I think that. I don't know what I can say to that. Okay, thank you. Any further questions, Councillor? No, I just have comments, so I'll wait to the end. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Councillor Baggy. <laughs> Wrong dang button. Sorry. Uh, I have a comment. No questions. No quite. Okay. okay. Thank you. So, so counselors, just, just to be straight here with regards to this, 
right now on the floor is that uh, we approve option two. Uh, if anyone wants to change that, we need to have uh, that change brought forward so that we can move to vote on the option that you wish. Does anyone wish to bring a different option to the table before we move to comments? Councillor Bruno. Forgive me, Mr. Mayor, were you saying that option two is up unless we want, uh, so, is up for a vote unless we want to comment? Perhaps I didn't hear that right. Yeah, yeah I'm not looking for comments, but I just want, want everybody to be clear. Right now, uh, as proposed, uh, that Council of the Corporation of the City of Port Coburn approve option two, continue to enforce the existing open air burning bylaw. What I'm saying is that if you want that change to a different option, we need to have uh, you guys put it on the floor to whatever option you want so that we can vote on that. Sure, I'm happy to go ahead. Go Frank's ahead. led this charge. I'm happy to let him go first. Okay. Either, either way. Councillor Danch. Thank you. I'm seriously thinking we should be looking at option four. I mean, holy cow, how many times are you going to beat around the bush here? So Backyard can, fire. So, Councillor, reasonable. Councillor, yes. before, we'll go to comments next. Can, can, you, okay. can you put that as an amendment to this to move with option four, if that's what you wish? Yes, I do. So, Councillor Dan please. Danch is moving to uh, change the uh, or amend the motion to option four. Do I have a seconder for that? Councillor Bruno, okay. Councillor Wells was there. Councillor Bruno, so it's on the floor. I'll go back to Councillor uh, Danch on comments on option four. And I think you just lost me, unless I'm coming back real time anytime soon. We can hear you, we just can't see you. Yeah, well, sometimes that's a good thing, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, obviously I, I've hit the wrong button here and I'll probably get an email shortly, but. I, I think it's time to back off a little bit on this issue. I mean, we under, we have to let the people know and understand that it's a small contained cooking fire. You're not drinking beer. You're not burning pallets. Don't come here and look for pallets because it's not going to happen. My host has asked me to start a video. Okay. Oh, there I am. <laughs> I'm back. Thank you for that. I just... We, we need to be reasonable here. Like, holy cow. We're, we're in a community with, with uh, agriculture around us. We're in a community with uh, parks on the edge of our, our town. I mean, come on already. Like, let's back off on this and uh, let's let people enjoy themselves within reason. If the fire truck shows up to my house, there's a reason why. And hopefully it's not because something's burning. Other than a small, contained, responsible a fire in your backyard with hot dogs, s'mores, young children enjoying what's going on. You're putting it out by 11 o'clock at night. You're not giving her and having a great big party out there. Let's be responsible. We've, we've, we've been fighting with this too long. The chief's adamant about his side, and we've got people that are adamant on the other side. I mean, we have pizza ovens out there. That's okay. We can have a barbecue and the guy's burning their meat that smells. That's okay. But we can't have a fire. I'm sorry. Option four. Let's move along. Let's get this over with. Too much time has been spent on it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Before I go, uh, I'm going to call in uh, Mr. Aquilina because he does have an answer to Councillor Wells' earlier question. But next will be Councillor Bruno, Councillor Demaray, then Councillor Bagu. Uh, they said they had comments, and I know Councillor Bruno seconded this. And then I'll go to the other councillors uh, once they've spoken. Uh, Mr. Aquilina, you want to give that answer? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to all of council, I've read the report and I see the reference to Schedule A of the official plan. And the only campground that is shown in Schedule A is, in fact, Shirkston Shores. But as we know, there is more than one campground in the city. But only Shirkston Shores is shown. Thank you, Mr. Aquilina. Councillor Wells, do you have a follow-up to that one? Uh, just uh, the comment to that, or the concern to that, uh, Your Worship, was that um, in order to allow campgrounds to be an exception, uh, we would, would have to change Schedule A to include all of them, or we would have to limit that exception to Shirkton Shores, which I don't think would be fair to the other campgrounds. Thank you, Councillor. 
Uh, Madam Clerk, can we include that as a friendly amendment if the mover and seconder are fine with that? So, uh, Councillor Danch and Councillor Bruno, are you fine to add that as a friendly amendment that um, we make sure Schedule A includes all our campgrounds? Is that fine with the two of you? Okay. Yes. Thank you. All right. Councillor Wells, that's fine. Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Councillor Wells. Um, so I'm going, Councillor Bruno, do you have any comments? You were the seconder on this. Did you have anything to add? I actually, it wasn't in the form of a motion like Frank just did, but basically that, I don't know if you want to separate it, but I would like to see an educational component um, handed out, Michelle doing a media release, that kind of thing that there are uh, still rules um, and the onus is on the homeowner to obey those rules. Uh, and I would like considering that it seems that whatever we decide, if there's a change, it's got to come back in two weeks, that it's circulated to the, I'm not sure what the, what the name is, is it EOC? Or EOC, the, that's, uh, that's correct. Yeah. Um, just at the end of the day, I think uh, during this crisis, all these kind of things should be reviewed on them. I don't think that they, they could come up with some other suggestions perhaps that aren't in the chief's list of conditions. But um, I'm just really concerned that a permit system allows for a lot of costs, a lot of second visits. I hear Councillor Caleb on the, on the you know, an educational or learning moment, but that is also all time. And I think these, you know, the sort of two and four really are gonna have the same rules. So, and I think they're fairly, you know, straightforward. And, uh, and not unreasonable. Uh, so I, I, Mr. Mayor, the only thing I would wanna to add to option four would be the education portion and uh, information and the running it by the uh, EOC. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Madam Clerk, are we fine if we ask Council to include those? Um, I don't know if an amendment uh, would be necessary for those. You can ask the Chief, but I did I uh, think in discussions, his plan was to work on an educational campaign before this came back as a bylaw. Okay, so Chief, we're fine with uh, you including the education portion in there? That By you, all means. That was, part of your, that was part of what you were going to do anyways? That's correct, Your Worship. I, I could, if I could just ask a question of Council to try to speed this process up rather than us come back and then have to do another revisit. Uh, I would like to ask Council if they're satisfied with the clearances or do they want it modified? from five meters to three meters. Uh, that might be a, a suggestion we should have now. Uh, Councillor Bruno and I did have that discussion earlier today. Uh, I think uh, if the intent is to try to get this thing done as quickly as possible, that would help. Uh, I, I, if you want to mirror the uh, Welland uh, bylaw, they certainly uh, go with three meters from any property line or anything that's combustible. The only variable would be if I added a height restriction of uh, you must have 15 feet of clearance similar to what uh, Welland. Other than that, it would be identical to Welland. Okay. So the education portion then, Councillor Bruno, is going to be brought forward through the chief anyways. And then um, the CAO knows that he's going to vet this with the EOC in their next meeting. So that's, that doesn't really have to be part of the motion because they're going to do that with our direction anyways. Does any councillor want to change uh, under item... Um, 2.21, the minimum distance from buildings it is at five meters. Um, if, if, does anybody want to change that? Just put up your hand. Councillor Danch. Yep, Councillor Danch. Sorry, okay. So five, five meters, if you want to go English, just over the 16 foot mark. Five meter high fire? I don't think so. No, no, no. Uh, this is not high, this is distance. The chief had mentioned no, that's not in here yet. That's my second question to you guys. We're just dealing with the distances now of, of five meters on whether you want to mirror Welland to reduce it to three meters. Fine. Is five fine? Five is fine with you? Okay. Councillor Clayla, if you had a comment on that? I, I would like to see us mirror Welland only because if they've had good luck with that and it's been a good amount of... Did they, Chief Carter, did they give you any... Any 
did the chief there have anything to say about the distances of three compared to the five when he spoke to you? Chief Cartwright. Uh, your, your worship through you to council. Uh, in speaking with the chief this afternoon, they, they go with three meters versus our suggestion of five meters. Uh, the restriction with regards to the height isn't the height of the fire, it's the clearances above the fire. You've got to have yeah. 15 feet of clearance above the fire pit. So that, that would take away from overhangs, that would take away from canopies, that would take away from trees and things of that nature. So you're talking, you're just saying from property lines, it needs to be 16 feet with the five meters, right? Oh, you're not no. talking height. Your Worship, I, if, if I could. Yes. Um, right now I'm recommending five meters from property lines, anything that will burn, including buildings, brush of, of that nature. That's what is in this report under option four. In speaking with Brian Kennedy, the chief of Welland today, what I'm asking for mirrors exactly what they have with two exceptions. One is they don't use a distance of five meters. They use three meters, which is uh, nine feet roughly versus 15 feet. And they use 15 feet of overhead clearance, not size of fire, but that's the overhead clearance. Those are the only two things that are different. Councillor Clayla? And because I don't do fires, I'm not particularly sure. I don't have much to say about maybe some of the other people who have campfires know more about this than I do as far as the distance. Thank you, Councillor Clayla. So in essence, Councillor, what uh, the fire chief has proposed what you, in front of you is the five meters or 16.4 feet. So to be quite frank, in any direction, so whether it's the height or width from the fire, it picks up what Welland does in two sections where he's picked it up under one. If you want to separate that where you have a distance, if you want to remove it, or sorry, move it, move it down to what Welland states of the three meters, but you can still leave the five meter height above the fire, um, you can do that. Or you can just leave it at five meters. If everybody's fine with five meters, then, then that's fine. Councillor Bruno? Well, I was just going to comment on the height. It seems to be pretty important to me that you wouldn't want a, a, a fire with it, uh, the, the sparks and anything hitting an overhang or things like I almost think that's as or more important uh, than, the, than the distance to uh, a property line. But um, like Councillor Califf, I'm not a fire uh, uh, expert, but I don't see a downside unless someone can enlighten me on uh, overhang height issue. Councillor Wells. This is a question to uh, Chief Cartwright, uh, your worship. Uh, Chief Cartwright, does uh, Welland exclude campgrounds from uh, their uh, requirements? Through your worship, I can't answer that question at this time. I'd have to research that. Okay. Councillor Wells. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, seeing no amendment on that, we'll leave it at the five meters right now. Uh, Councillor Kalela. Can I change it to be the three meters, the same as well in mirroring it, but leaving it the height as, as the chief has it? Could sure. I make that motion? Uh, we can to add To make that. the one change and leave the other the same. We, we can add that as an amendment. Can I make the amendment? Yeah, then we'll vote on the amendment as amended. amended yeah. uh, no. So... What Councillor Clayliff is asking for is that we change this, that it says property lines and combustible materials of not less than three meters plus uh, a five meter height above the fire. Chief, is that uh, fine with you? That's that's what Welland is doing, Your Worship. Okay. So that's an no, amendment. No, but I, actually, I'm sorry, Your, Your Honor. I was saying that, can we leave the height the same, the two foot height? All I'm saying is reduce yeah. the property line, but leave the height the same, the two feet. Does that not no. seem reasonable? No, it's not two feet. It's the five meters. Well, it is five meters height, not the height of the fire counselor. Combustibles above the fire. So it could be a tree, could be an overhang. Um, but I'm saying, can we just change the one rather than both of them? Or, or is that not something you would do as a... No, you can't. You, you, you can have your diameter of combustibles from a fire down to three meters but your height should mirror if you want to mirror welland should be there five meters so anything that's combustible above the fire 
should be five meters or higher. So mo like most common things are trees and the overhang of a building. Oh, all right, then I, if we mirrored Wellens. All right, Councillor. I'm just, I, I'm reading it. I'm just saying in, it says three foot in diameter and a height of 0.6 meters, two feet. I thought that that was the height that the chief was talking about. No, we're not changing the diameter and a height. That's, that's to do with the fire. What we're dealing with is item one only. Minimum distance from buildings, property lines, and combustible materials. That's the oh, only so you're saying it's five meters regardless, five meters from combustibles height and I, I understand now. Yes, yeah, so we either stick with five meters for everything or we reduce the diameter. So going out from the fire three meters like Welland has and leaving the five meters for the height above a fire. Do you want to change that or to leave it the same? I'm going to leave that to someone else simply because I'm not an expert at fire. So this is something. Okay, so that's off the table then. Anyone else with regards to that change? Okay, so we are leaving it at five meters. Councillor Bruno, did you have a question on that? Well, yes, I, I guess I'm concerned that if we've had a bylaw all these years with five meters, when you reduce, if something happens, is there a situation where you had five meters, what gave you the idea that that was too much? I'm always wary when you change a distancing going lower w without good rationale. If there's not a potential legal ramification to that, um, then I'm happy with the mimicking well. And if there is, and we're putting the chances of the fire going up just because of the sake we want to mimic well, and then I'm probably not, but I wouldn't mind hearing from the chief on that. Chief, with regards to distance, can you give us a comment on that, please? Your Worship, um, all, I, all I can say is uh, I, I, I made a quick call this afternoon after talking to Councillor Bruno, uh, just to check in my own mind. Uh, I, I, I would suggest, I mean, if we're gonna err on the side of safety, we should leave it at five meters, quite frankly, I'm gonna be honest with you. But the reality is in our conversation today is you, you need to, and I'm certain you recognize that if you go with 16.5 feet on either side of a three foot diameter fire pit, there's going to be a multitude of properties in the city that are going to be unable to have a small fire that they can sit and enjoy. Um, my thinking was we've got a neighbor and it seems to be working relatively well. And I'm not going to try to mislead you in the sense that they don't have problems because they certainly do have problems with smoke and or people deciding to burn furniture and the like. But we have those here too. But that's the reality is I'm, I'm comfortable saying for the size of the fire that we're suggesting we use within the proposed option number four, that I believe three meters should put us in a position of safety versus uh, uh, a potential fire. I believe, and again, I wasn't responsible for writing the original bylaw, but I believe the five meters goes back to before my time when they put that in place because of rural, rural type fires, because the previous chiefs before me didn't want fires in the urban part of the city. So they never, they never addressed it through a bylaw. Councilor Bruno. I'm okay with that. Um, to, to then reduce to the three for that reason, keep the, the five meter height. The other, just one well, last thing I thought of. Councilor, sure. just, can we deal with yep. this? So yep. Councilor Clayliff withdrew her, um, Amendment. Do you want to put that on the floor then, as an amendment to the amendment, which is what it is? Are you asking me? Yes, I am. Yes. Yes, I would. Okay. So right now we have Councillor Bruno bringing an amendment under item 2.21, moving the materials of not less than three meters in diameter and, and a height of five meters, mimicking Welland. Do I have a seconder for that? Councillor Danch. 
questions to that amendment only? Any questions to that amendment? Councillor Kalela. I just want to thank the Chief for the explanation. That made it much clearer for me. Thank you. Not Councillor Danch. Question? Comment. No question. Okay. So seeing no more questions, Councillor Danch. I just want to thank the time that everybody spent on this. And I know I've been adamant about trying to get this, but I mean, I've, we all get phone calls and we live in that so-called fishbowl. People have to understand that we're going out on a limb for you to be responsible in your own backyard to get along with your neighbor. We're not talking about the fellow on the east side that wants to burn an oil drum full of wood. That don't happen. That's not right. And the guys with the big red trucks and the flashing lights are going to show up and they're going to charge you. Be responsible, people. We're all trying to get along here. And I, I know I've gone on a limb here. And I thank the people beside me that are doing this Zoom thing. Let's do the right thing, guys. Okay? Let's sit at home. Let's be in our backyards. 11 o'clock, you're going inside. That's enough. You're not hooting and hollering. And the chief's not going to get a phone call. All right? That's my only comment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, we lost Councillor Demmer. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, Councillor Bruno? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to um, uh, speak to, and, and perhaps it's, it, you'll still entertain this after, is it appropriate now? I wanted to. Are you, are you um, talking? Well, no, we're just dealing with your amendment right now. So that's until, fine. Until that's done. Yeah, I'll come back to you. We're, we, we've lost Councillor Demeray. We're just waiting for her to get back into this in case she has a question on the amendment to the amendment. We'll just wait a minute. Councillor Wells. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just I have a, a concern on the amendment in regards to the, the exclusion of campgrounds. Uh, I think they that uh, amendment should also include the excluding 2.2B. Uh, .2 uh, I think that if uh, these conditions are what is deemed to be the safest conditions, uh, they should be practiced by all owners uh, within the city limits or within the, the city. Um, so I think that these concerning these safety uh, conditions and uh, which would be permitting a fire um, then I think uh, campgrounds should also be subjected to that as well. So we, we've asked staff to include those counts as well. So the missing campgrounds um, would be brought back into that portion of the bylaw. Um, so that was part of the original Your amendment to bring in item four. Your Worship, I'm asking to exclude campgrounds, not to exclude oh. campgrounds. Oh, sorry. Right now, so campgrounds are, are excluded from these conditions. But if all the owners uh, are required to con, um, uh, be consistent with these conditions then because of safety, then so should campgrounds. Okay, I, I get what you're saying, Councillor. So in essence, what we'll need to do is have staff bring that back to us? But does, does staff have to come back with any type of report to us on that? Okay. Chief Cartwright, with regards to item B, would, would that need um, a different motion that would uh, hopefully by the next meeting come back to council to rescind that portion of our bylaws? Or can we delete that tonight? Your, your, your Worship, uh, I understand what's being uh, suggested about campgrounds, but quite frankly, if you use property lines, um, there will be no campfires in any campgrounds. If we go that route, they would not be permissible. Uh, we've allowed uh, we've allowed it under previous bylaws, um, and basically they're enforced by their own security people uh, within that within those campgrounds. Uh, I'm not against what's being suggested. I just don't think you could have a meaning have a fire in a campground such as Shirkston, if I can be so blunt to say that, under the restrictions that were maybe passed by council this evening. Uh, I, I, I think you'll find that the lot lines and the lot spaces uh, just won't accommodate it. 
So I, I think that needs to be given some serious thought. I'm not against it because as you all know, I prefer to have less fires than more, but the reality is I, the campfires haven't been a problem in Shirkston because they are well managed uh, and they are overseen by the security people. Uh, we do go down and visit them on a regular basis and have conversations with them. I don't get a lot of complaints about uh, what's going on in the campgrounds from people that go into the campgrounds because I think they expect it. I do get complaints from people on the outside to go along with what Mr. or Councillor Danch has said, uh, complaining about why why can they have a campfire but I can't. I think uh, you might find that uh, if you if you apply the same restrictions to a campground such as Shirkston, it's going to become a big issue for the city as a whole. Okay, so Councillor Walls, if we can come back to that. Councillor Demery, welcome back. Um, Councillor Demery, we do have uh, an amendment to the amendment on the floor, which is that we take the minimum distance from buildings, property lines, and combustible materials of not less than three metres, and then adding also with a five metre distance above the fire. So it mirrors Welland. So where the fire is sitting, the diameter out from it can be, combustibles must be at least 10 feet away. And then the fire cannot affect anything up to 16.4 uh, feet above it. So if you had a fire underneath a tree and the branches were three feet above the fire, you're not allowed to do that. Did you have any questions on that uh, amendment that we're voting on now? Uh, no, I'm just, I had, my concerns were around option two, but it looks like council is taking a different direction. So I'm good. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Any further questions on this portion of the amendment? Seeing none, please raise your hand. All in favor? All opposed? That's carried. So now we go back to the amendment as amended. Um, any further questions on that one before I go to comments? So it's item four that we're dealing with as amended by mirroring Welland on the distances. Any further questions? Councillor Bruno. I'm, I'm confused a bit in that I thought we just passed option four. No, you. And I was, was going to go back to the yeah. chief and Harry about the campground issues. No, no, we're actually. Okay. We amended, we amended option four through your motion. So now we vote on option four as amended. Okay. Okay. So now we can take questions with regards to what Councillor Wells brought forward with item B, um, if you guys want to speak to that. So I'll go to Councillor Wells first because he did bring that up. So Councillor Wells, if you want to bring up item B on how we should deal with that. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, to me, item B shows a, uh, a bias toward campgrounds. Um, so we should either uh, afford the owners of property, uh, which could be the same size as the campgrounds um, or smaller, the same uh, recognition for their uh, capabilities and um, abilities to be able to uh, follow strict guidelines in regards to um, backyard camp uh, campfires. Um, so I think that whatever we do for the campgrounds, we should do for uh, the general owners of the, the properties within Port Coburn and vice versa. Thank you, Councillor. So Chief, with regards to that comment, I mean, item one, which we just dealt with, really deals with what you were speaking with. All the rest are, are pretty common sense, whether you're, you're in a campground or not. Um, so what you're saying is that the three meters, um, and I assume we, they, they should be able to get 16.4 feet above the fire, but you're saying the three meters might not be able to be met. Is that what you're commenting on? I, uh, your worship, I, I think what I'm commenting on, and, and again, I haven't been to Shirkson over the last well, last number of months, but the reality is knowing the size of the lots, as I do in Shirkston, uh, if you put a constraint on a, on a campground such as Shirkston, they may not be able to meet it. Now, I can check on that between now and the next meeting, but it might mean that you're gonna to have to do another amendment, which is gonna put this off again, uh, which I'm, I'm totally willing to do, uh, come back. Uh, and quite frankly, as I said earlier, uh, 
I'd love to see it safer than what it is, but the reality is, I think, I think, not knowing the layout of the lots, that it could become a bit of a problem, in particular for lot lines in in Shirkston. Um, uh, the other thing that needs to be remembered by council, if I could say this, you're dealing with situations there that. Uh, sometimes lead to other issues uh, that have happened over the years in Shirkston Shores, uh, which I believe they've taken significant steps to correct. Uh, we haven't had a single issue with regards to camp. We have had multiple fires in Shirkston Shores, I'll, I'll say that, and other issues, but uh, certainly not from the cause of a campfire. Uh, they have had an issue with uh, an individual getting burnt severely in a campfire. That was outside of our bailiwick because we don't have any oversight over Shirkston Shores with regards to campfires because they are exempted. Uh, but if council chose to say they got to play by the same rules, I'd be more than happy to enforce it. Thank you, Chief. Councillor Wells? Again, it, it's just a, um, a recognition of equality. Um, so, so Councillor, again, did you want to... If the owners of of Shirkton or the uh, individual um, units within Shirkton can meet the, the as, as the chief has explained it, uh, a seller uh, safety record, then we should be of, um, acknowledging or at least giving the opportunity to the owner, owners of uh, private properties the same. That's all. So, so Councillor Wells, did you want to remove item B then? Is that what you're asking? If we can't remove it because of what the chief is saying is that they have, they do, they cannot meet the physical uh, characteristics in order to satisfy these conditions. Uh, the, and then if we waive these conditions for campgrounds, then we shouldn't, have, then we shouldn't restrict these conditions on owners of uh, private properties either. No. Okay. Further questions to item four then? Councillor Bruno, then Councillor Danch. Uh, thank you, Worship. I, I think Councillor Wells' um, concern on fairness and equitability have a lot of um, rationale and reasoning behind them. I would say this, though, that in a campground, you face with various types of customers. So if you're camping for the weekend or you're coming in and you're going in a back field, a traditional tent camping, you can meet you can meet the these new options. In the in the existing areas for which lot sizes were designed based usually in most it's hard back in the 80s if they were there. But in most things now that have site plan agreements, it's been a discussion with fire officials on to get safe distances. So typically you can have a unit, if it's an eight wide, you can put an eight foot deck and it's usually like a 38 to 40 foot lot. If you got a 12 wide, you can do a 12 wide deck and then you probably only got about 16 feet left. It would be very, you couldn't, undo most of these lots because of the way the pedestals are, how close people are together. But oddly enough, I think tonight we've wanted to write something we've felt wrong and now we're going to change something for which we've had no issues on and create a new one. The thought I had is that if you're building new trailer courts or you're building, developing your park, that needs to be a consideration for your site plan to get to build your new lot. If you've got an existing lot and you can't widen it, um, I, I think that's sort of, um, you know, dealing with the horse after it's left the barn. That They've been that way and now this is withdrawing them back. I would say another thing is, is that the, the sites where you have those people that close together are, are like single detached owners in town who have a vested interest in doing anything else. 
the part that could meet the requirement is somebody that's in there for a night or a weekend or in a rental unit. And I, I think from a practical point of view, you could do something going forward to new builds, but I think the chief's comments about what both those parks have as a fire record is now boxing them back in something that traditionally allows fires, as Councillor Dan said earlier, camping, and and changing that upside down on a dime, which I also don't think is fair. Thank you. So I, I mean, I'd like to see the existing ones then be grandfathered, and whatever's new is new, and the ownership at parks have allowed to adjust to that. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor. That's Dan. all I have. Yeah, Councillor Danch. Comment? Yes, and thank you to you, Mayor, and everybody else. I call it parking lot camping because I was fortunate enough that I went north a lot and our sites were larger. But I, I have camped at Churchton years back when I uh, was first introduced to it with the family. The, the lots are what they are. Most of them have a tire ring. Um, you can only do so much with a tire ring. I, uh, I don't want to shoot these guys down because these people come out of the big city and they think they're in heaven and they are because they're in our community and we welcome them. And I think the chief's correct with his, you know, designation on, you know, the distances and stuff like that. I don't think we should be picking on our trailer parks. I think, I think they're, they're responsible enough. They have their own private security. I think we should just kind of leave the parks alone, let them have their tiring fire. We, we've, we've got over a hurdle here tonight with uh, our in-town burning and we should leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Baggio. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I haven't talked much tonight, but uh, my just comment, um, Pleasant Beach Campground, I go by there quite a bit. It is a lot of trees in there, which thank goodness it has a shade the weather here i don't think they're going to be able to pass the uh diameter i think they're good campers they're safe campers and also the boy scout camp which is on city property i like to have them exempt also so all campgrounds and chair parks are exempt and that's just my comment thank you thank you counselor a any more questions okay so just to confirm what we're voting on is um option four with the amendment on 2.2.1, which was done earlier. Also included were the education component, the EOC component, and on item B that, uh, that Dan's department will look at all other campgrounds in the, in the municipality, which has been brought up this evening. Um, does everybody understand that? Okay, I'm gonna take the vote. All in favor, please raise your hand. Oh, sorry, Angie, can you, oh, there she is. You're all set, Angie, to vote? Oh, okay. So all those yes, in favor, oh, sorry, go ahead, Angie. I said it's set for now. I'll be going back off when the vote's done. Okay. All those in favor, raise your hand, please. That, it, uh, all those opposed? That's carried. So now the main motion is amended. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if I may. Yes, yes Councillor. Um, when we started through that, that whole uh, item, there was a point at which you asked me to speak and I said, I don't have any questions. I do have some things I wanted to say though. And waited. I said I would wait to the end, but then council took a turn and threw away um, option B, option two, and went on to option four. And there was no discussion on the original option, which is really something that should not have happened, but it did. Um, nothing I can do about it now because council has actually accepted it, but there was all of what I had to say was the reasons why we should not just easily throw out option two. Um, and that's fine. I see that there's a, a, a real wish to have fires in backyards, but I think this is going to come back and bite us. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Okay. So we go back to the original motion as amended. 
So Fire and Emergency Services Department Report 2020-35, subject open burning bylaw. The Council of the Corporation of City of Fort Coleman approved option number four. Uh, as uh, uh, debated this evening, any further comments on that? Councillor Bagu. Thank you, Mr. Murray. Just commenting on item four, right? Well, it's it's because we've made the amendment to change it from the original option two as presented by staff. Council had amended that to now make it option four, which was the the debate we went through on those amendments. Do you, you can have you can ask any questions you want, but it but it is option four that is being brought forward. I have a problem with option four. I just want to get comment on option four. That's all. That's that's fine. You can ask your question. Basically, uh, like also, if it is passed that wind velocity is an issue, other municipalities have it. And basically, I, I find because the fire chief is sort of biased against fires, that we have bylaw take the lead on this, on changing the bylaw. And the fire chief will work with bylaw, but bylaw takes the lead on it. And uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, either through the chief or CAO. Either one of you want to comment on this? CAO first? Your Worship, I can. Oh. If, if uh, Scott wants to go ahead, he can, but I certainly can. Uh, the problem you're up against, Councillor, is that uh, the 911 calls go to fire dispatch. Uh, bylaws doesn't work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, where we do. Uh, I think you're going to find that difficult. Uh, go for it if you want, because that takes a big load off us, but I just don't know how you're going to make it work under, our cert under the circumstances we're currently in. Uh, CAO? So through your worship, Councillor Baggio, I'm a little bit unclear if the request is about bylaw enforcing the bylaw or bylaw writing and crafting the bylaw. Um, obviously, if it's enforcing, the chief's comments would prevail what he just said. We can't send bylaw officers out in the middle of the night to a house, a residential fire, um, campfire. If it's the, the latter, if you're talking about bylaw writing the bylaw, bylaw staff preparing the bylaw, I, th I think you need to know that the verbiage that's in the staff report at the top of page 15 and the bottom, sorry, bottom of page 15 and top of page 16, page five and six of the report is verbatim what will end up in our burning bylaw. So we'll have the existing burning bylaw with those two paragraphs added and the amendments that were made tonight. And we'll clarify the wording around uh, campgrounds in the official plan to make sure that it's accurate. And that's what you'll have before you next council meeting. Those changes that the that council's approving tonight in the existing bylaw, no staff report, just a bylaw for you to approve. Okay, Councilor Baggett. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I was, asking that bylaw do the crafting of it. Yeah. And as Councillor Clearly and Councillor Wells stated, have them go to the municipalities, get, get the best of the best and put it in our bylaws and bring it back to council. An example like wind velocity, it, it's important. So like, especially you park over. Through your worship There's to other Councilor issues that have to be, it has to be looked at and done properly. Through your worship to Councillor Baggio, this is the final wording and in much the same way as we changed item I, minimum distance from buildings, property lines, and so on to be three meters, you can change anything you want. But what you see from 2.1 open air burning all the way down to 2.3, the last 2.3A, city's fee schedule, there's no more writing. That's what's going to come back in two weeks, including whatever changes you make tonight. So you yourself could say, I move that we amend 2.2 A subsection 8 to be a wind direction of, or sorry, wind intensity of 20 kilometers per hour, or you could leave it exactly like it is, but there is no more crafting taking place other than what council decides to craft tonight, or if somebody makes an amendment to the bylaw that will be before you in the uh, June council meeting. Okay. Councillor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right. So any further questions on the motion as amended? Angie, any questions? No, none at all. Thank you. 
Seeing none, please raise your hand. As soon as I call on you. Okay, there's Angie. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? That's carried. We'll now proceed with item number two, Chief Administrative Officer Department Report 2020-66, subject Carl Road Allowance Proposed Sale. Our mover is Councillor Bagu. Our seconder is Councillor Bodner. Uh, does anybody have a question on this? Councillor Bodner? Councillor Bodner? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I had a constituent uh, wonder. I don't have a problem with selling uh, Carl Road. I think that's uh, that makes a lot of sense. But there's two wood lots on there, and um, the question was: the constituent said they're old growth wood lots, and um, they should be saved. And with Carl Road going right through the middle of them, why would we not keep that section of Carl Road? Um, where it actually goes through those two woodlots. My question is, do we know whether those are uh, somehow protected, those woodlots, so that we should even consider this? Uh, Mr. Aquilina? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Councillor Bodner. In fact, there are two, those two woodlots you mentioned, they're actually provincially significant wetlands. So it's buyer beware what you're buying. They are aware of what the designation is. And so any development or clearing of trees would need approval from the region of Niagara. Councilor Bodner. Okay, that's that clarifies my thoughts on that then. I, um, I just would like to see um, does it make any sense? Would it help those wood lots if we actually uh, kept a piece of that Carl Road? I don't believe we're letting the proponent exit Carl Road onto second concession. Would it make any sense to, uh, to keep that section of Carl Road? Mr. Aquilina? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bodner. I can't speak for Council. That's a matter of Council to consider. The agreement has not been executed yet. This report is seeking the direction of Council for myself to actually draft the sales agreement that would then come back to Council upon the time that Council closes, stops up the road for consideration. So, Councillor Bodner, with regards to that, yes, the, the, the proponent all, already owns the land on either side of our 66 feet. Right. So the majority of our 60 feet, six feet doesn't have trees on it. So you're not talking a lot of trees that sit on ours. So their section on either side of that road is already under uh, provincial control. So um, we're only talking that narrow strip that we have. So. The, you know, and Dan says that they already are aware of, of what the provincial statement is. <clears throat> okay, then I'll wait to hear from someone else if they have a comment on this before I proceed further. Thanks. Oh, that's fine. Thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Bagu? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, um, the Councillor Bagu, years ago when I was a young whippersnipper, we used to rabbit hunt it up in those bushes in the uh, it was a managed wood lot, so there wasn't wood clearing by loggers at that time because we used to hunt out of the bush piles. But over the years, it probably has changed ownership, but there, there is no real old growth trees in there. They've been logged out many years ago. And uh, that's it, thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Any further questions, Councillor? I'll go back to Councillor Bodden. Thank you. So if it if it's a, a significant wetland, then that kind of takes those old growth trees out of there, I would think. 
and um, I can live with with what the proposal is there. I just wanted to get clarity on uh, on what those wood lots were all about. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, and noting the uh, already mentioned uh, conflicts, if there's no further questions, all those in favor, please raise your hand. That's carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. We will now proceed with item number three, Chief Administrative Officer Department Report 2020-70, subject COVID-19, update number two. Our mover is Councillor Clayla. Our seconder is Councillor Bruno. Um, I'll have the CAO lead this off before I take questions. Mr. Louis? Sure. Through your worship to the City Council and the public watching at large, I uh, started writing this report, I think, over three weeks ago. So some of the information is uh, not as timely as Council probably would have liked, but I prepared some verbal remarks that I'll add as an update for the community as far as the City's response to the pandemic. Uh, I believe in my last report, I mentioned that there were three phases in the City's pandemic response. That, at the time, we were in the maintaining essential services phase, and the next phase would be recovery and reopening. We are still in the maintaining essential, essential services phase, but senior staff at the city have their eye on recovery. So far, each department director has presented a recovery plan for their department to the emergency control group to help plan the reopening of our city's programs, services, and facilities. It is important that the reopening is done in a safe and gradual way. Plans for certain facilities are not for a fast opening and must consider staff and public safety. For example, the library is permitted to offer curbside pickup of library books as of last Tuesday, but it will be next week before we have the policies, procedures, and training in place to offer the service. This methodology applies to all of our facilities, the marina, playground equipment, and sports fields even the arena where, where it could be a situation that when we are allowed to open, we will take our time to do it safely and gr gradually. Given a decision between a rapid opening and the safety of our community and our staff, we will choose safety every time, even if it means delaying opening. Cost is another consideration. Precautions must be in place to open our facilities and welcome the community back. But if the cost of the precautions outweighs the benefits, we may have to delay opening until a more reasonable precaution can be put in place. The next thing I want to draw Council's attention to is the level of service section of my report. Level of service at the City can be reduced for one of two reasons. Number one, the effect of the pandemic on our workforce. If our workers are sick, we will not have the staff to continue to operate at the 100% level of service. Fortunately, this has been avoided so far. As the number of cases in Niagara continues to plateau, sorry, the number of new cases per day continues to plateau and sometimes decrease, we hope this will remain the case, but we do have to continue to monitor the situation and determine whether we can maintain services. The second reason that the level of service must be considered is the financial impact of the pandemic. As Council is aware from my previous report, the city has lost revenue in March, April, and May due to the pandemic and has realized some increased costs. Management has committed to making up these losses in the current year from the current budget so that there will be no financial impact on next year's tax rate. So far, about two-thirds of the impacts have been addressed and staff is confident about finding the other one-third. Some of these savings come from a hiring freeze and layoffs at the staff level. This translates into a reduced level of service in the community, especially in the Community and Economic Development Department as it pertains to parks and in roads as it pertains to operational, everything that's non-essential. Seasonal workers that student and, and students that typically work on grass cutting and weekend maintenance of parks and downtown areas have not been hired to save money. This means that these areas are not as clean in appearance as in past years. The same is true for seasonal workers at the Marina and Nickel Beach. If these facilities open without the full staff complement, 
we will not be able to provide services at the 100% level. The financial report <coughs> attached as an appendix to my report this evening is based on information that was current a few weeks ago. It is hoped that as this information is updated, staff will be able to provide a clearer financial picture to Council and we will be able to increase the level of service as we move through recovery to a fully reopened city. Some city services are reopening faster than we projected based on provincial announcements and as that occurs and as the city realizes revenues from those services, management can revisit the financial impacts on the municipality and quickly act to correct staffing levels to provide the best balance between service and savings for our community, all while keeping safety in mind. And I'll answer any questions that Council has. Thank you. Any questions to the CAO? Councillor Bruno? Thank you, Worship. Um, one of the reasons I added this to my list was that the situation is fluid, and I'm encouraged by the words you said this evening, Mr. CAO. You know, we're in a, not only a dynamic situation, but we are a summer resident community. We are a summer um, highlight service with marinas, our parks, and things that we do. What I really was looking for, um, I like the value of those um, potential jump off points and milestones. And, you know, if you do two cuts of grass every, instead of one, it, 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 it manages it. What, as much as I appreciate that level of detail, I don't want to micromanage in the sense that if, if all of a sudden, you know, you're now, as it's turned out from your uh, originally writing this report, if I'm understanding it correctly, the marina now doesn't have to be every two slips. And somewhere else you might have saved money and somewhere else it might be costing you more money. If the net net of all of that is that you're telling us that the original goal of not starting 221 in the ditch, i.e. a deficit, can still be ma maintained, then I would like to leave the latitude for you to react according to decisions. Personally, I don't think that issues like some of that grass cutting situation without students is not going to come back to bite us in all different kind of ways. And they're a fairly low cost item. If you needed someone who's been not hired, but is going to be hired after COVID, I don't have any problem with you hiring them or starting the process because you've realized you're still going to have enough money to get us back to net zero. So while I appreciate the detail, I'd like you to be able to react on the ground as the situation permits. So if, if you can assure me that the overall goal of not, is not starting 220 in the, in the 221 in the ditch with a deficit, then I wanna give you the latitude to react. And if that is bring on four students or bring on two now at the marina or hire somebody that you were gonna hire anybody anyways, I, I want to do it. So, so my question to you is, uh, with all this fluidness, are you confident you can still bring us in the end of 220 without a deficit, knowing what you know now? Mr. Lewis? Through your worship to Councillor Bruno, the short answer is yes. I am confident that we can address all of the financial impacts within the current year. The long answer is, I'm gonna need council support for that. So what that means is, when you get that call from that resident that says, I was walking my dog and the grass was three inches, but I like it when it's two inches, you might have to say, look, in order that taxes don't increase next year to pay a pandemic related deficit, I signed off on that on May 25th. So that's where council comes in and the sort of support for staff comes in. I have, in some cases, half the staff out there trying to do 100% of the work and they're struggling. So the changes are, 
when I first wrote this report and we were looking at almost $1.5 million, that was almost 100% of the marina revenue. Now that the marina is beginning to open and is in fact going to open at about two-thirds capacity, I might have a little bit of budget to play with to get the staff there that can help keep the docks clean and clean, keep the bathrooms clean at the marina and so on. So I can address the level of service as the revenue picture becomes clearer and clearer. But 75% is not 100. And so if I have to keep my expenses down in the 75% level so that the marina doesn't come in with a deficit. If the beach opens in 2020, and that's an if right now, the same thing. I can't send all of the ex spend all of the expenses that council's already approved, but come back to you with 60% of the revenues because that 40% has to be made up from somewhere. So that's the sort of struggle that staff is addressing right now, and we're working diligently at addressing that. The other thing is that some of the savings come come from other places. So maybe there's a capital project that's deferred to next year. Maybe we're buying less office supplies or you know we've already frozen travel city travel is frozen for council and staff no conferences virtually no training unless it's required to keep credentials so we're making the savings up in all areas of city operations so that we can reopen those public facing facilities that's the long answer the short answer was yes councilor burrow thank you worship i guess what i see that the issue is is that I don't want to see lag time. I want to see you be able to be nimble. And yes, I want my cake and eat it too. I want you to come in under and it doesn't leave us in the ditch. So if I'm hearing you correctly in this report, you're talking about the status a couple weeks ago, and that is how fast it moves. So if you, I mean, I'm happy to answer that resident's call, but I'm also not, I'm also not willing to, maybe the wrong way of saying it, um, let, let you off the hook to do what you got to do to make it happen. If, you know, I want as much of the same level of service as we had, but I also don't want to go under. You have the ability to duck and dive with what you cut and and uh, and save. I just don't want things that impact uh, people the most um, to have to suffer when now I'm hearing that you can meet the goal of no deficit. So uh, without going through more of a circular conversation here, uh, if you can manage the non-deficit situation, I want you to go with doing as much as you can. I can be very quick through the mayor to Councillor Bruno. Yes, that's correct. Uh, part of the way that I was coming in with the zero deficit though was the hiring freeze. But to be brief, um, some of those positions that were layoffs were crossing guards, were part-time workers and so on. And they will not be back because for example, school is not back. Some of them were uh, indoor positions, engineering positions, and so on. So they're not really that forward-facing public service. And the bulk of them were the students. Uh, the status of the student hiring is that it was suspended, not canceled. We did have offers out to students, or we had selected the students, and we were basically at the training stage. So I think we can quickly react and be nimble, as you've uh, requested, and make sure that if and when the emergency control group, as delegated by council, chooses to bring back or unfreeze hiring, I guess, for lack of a better term. Hopefully, we can get those students in the door as soon as possible to address the level of service that you've referenced. So the short answer is yes. Okay. Councilor Thank Ryan. you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. CEO. Um, Councilor Demery, do you have a question on this issue? No, I don't. I'm actually very pleased with what's going on, and I do trust that Scott will take care of what we need. Thank you, Councillor. Any further questions, Council? Council Kalela? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. To, um, to Mr. Louie, I, I agree you're doing a great job with things. I do agree with Council Bruno. I love to see you be quick off the mark. It, it's amazing how quickly things are moving, and I guess the one area that I've seen it, because 
simply because of where I live, is again, the downtown district. We've been trying to be so supportive of our businesses. I think they're doing a wonderful job. I think everybody is really pulling together for the most part we've had. We've had our issues, but I think every town's had issues. But at the same time, um, there's been a couple of things came up over this past weekend, and I just, I, I'm not sure, I'm sure you are aware of them, but I just wondered if you could give us a little bit of thought on it. Um, I, I've had some calls and concerns. I've seen people um, walking down West Street wanting to use washrooms, and I know that the stores, as much as they're open now, they're not allowed people into use washrooms. The washrooms at the pilot house are closed. I've had great concerns from people. I know that a couple of the um, shops did let people use the washrooms, but they, they had young children with them, and they, they felt that they had to let them. And, and they're, they're asking me, they're saying, please, please, can we open up the pilot house washrooms at the very least? I said, you know, I would, would ask about those kinds of things. Um, a couple other things, uh, very minimal things, actually, that people are asking about. And, and, and I look at this report, and these are things like, I, I think that we, Times are changing very quickly. We're trying to get back into doing things. We're trying to keep people happy so that they don't overstep. Uh, a lot of people are coming out and sitting and having fish and chips at Miners on Friday. The garbage cans are overflowing constantly. And rather than, I keep hearing people say to me, why don't you have more staff coming to emptying them more often? My answer to that is maybe we could, maybe just for the next few weeks, we could get a couple extra garbage cans put down there just temporarily in order that they don't staff don't need to go out there but there is a place for people to put the refuse so they're not it's not all over the place i'm just trying to figure out um you know the whole piece of this i i know there's been a lot of talk about enlarging patios um i'm being asked about those things i i said they're still in the works i know that the i think that the that you're all looking at those pieces um i try to ask people to you know to just relax and try to take things slowly and calmly but if you could address any of those things, are those things that possibly we could get? And I think perhaps, again, I'm happy to hear that we're looking at rehiring some of the students and a few of those pieces, because I think that you do need the help. There's a few places that we're falling short because we are recovering so well and so quickly. Thank you, Councillor. Mr. Louis? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Kalele, if I can address all of that, if I remember it all. Uh, there's a few things there to unpack. So washrooms, um, I'm aware of the washroom issue. We so we have the emergency control group, the ECG. We've been meeting since March 13th. Of course, the washrooms would have opened for the first time uh, the weekend before this past weekend. So it's not particularly a level of service that has been terribly reduced so far. But our question was around the safety of people using those washrooms and the possible transmission of the coronavirus if it was, if it was used. And we can clean, but which also means bringing in staff to clean. Um, on Saturdays and Sundays when there typically isn't a staff person on anyway, which means increasing the costs of the pandemic on taxpayers. Um, and so the decision was made simply not to open them. Uh, I am absolutely willing to open them if that's council's wish. We can put up a big sign that says these washrooms aren't cleaned, bring your own sanitizer. We can tell people that they have to put their own precautions in place, but we can't guarantee that when a cleaner leaves the washroom, the first person mm -hmm. who touches a fixture hasn't left coronavirus in there for every person who comes until the next person uses the washroom. And one of the biggest problems we'll face in the, in the months to come, especially during a heat wave, is not being consistent with other municipalities. And this is probably an issue where half the municipalities will open their public washrooms and half of them won't for exactly that reason. And half of our community will say, why are the washrooms open? You know, they'll call City Hall, they'll email the mayor. How can you guys open these washrooms? It's not safe. And the other half will say, I want these washrooms open. I want to use them. So I would absolutely, our decision so far has been that it's not safe for the transmission of the pand pandemic. But if council was to direct me to do otherwise, I certainly would. I will keep going. Garbages, I'm aware of the issue this past weekend with garbage containers overflowing on West Street. It was a little bit, it was an issue the week before as well, Victoria mm -hmm. Day weekend, a little bit less prevalent, but more so this week. The immediate action we took was to put out more receptacles, as you've mentioned. Um, it is simply a function of staff. I'm trying to save taxpayer money by not having staff come in on Saturday and Sunday, and then of course we get hit with a heat wave and the un and curbside pickup and restaurants that can't serve people in their dining room. 
So the unintended consequence is paper containers being stuffed into garbage cans and, and really our city not looking as good as it usually does. I can absolutely address that with hiring. That comes at an expense, and I think that's what Councillor Bruno was talking about. So uh, mm -hmm. leave that one with me. We're also looking for creative solutions. We're looking for shift changes. Staff are talking about how we can keep the city looking as good as possible, um, particularly with garbage. Um, the last thing I want to say is just general. Like The weather is absolutely an impact on us, and, and with the weather, we're going to have pressure on us for opening Nickel Beach. We saw pressure to open the boat ramp. Uh, people want the marina open as fast as possible. It's important, and all of my staff, the directors at the city, have presented plans on how they're going to open. And it's important to me that we stick to those plans, and it would be very easy to say, I know we plan to open the marina in two weeks, or to open the library for curbside pickup in two weeks, but I think you should change and open it in three days, because it needs to be done safely for the user as well as the provider of the service, the staff. So on that basis, we're still monitoring our plans. We're looking at them all the time. Uh, we'll probably do something different. We've already changed our mind on the marina and gone towards more boats than we originally planned. We might yet change our mind on the beach, uh, particularly Cedar Bay, um, which is not staffed. Nickel Beach, which is staffed, might be a different situation. But it's important that we stick to our recovery plans, and that's what staff is working on. Uh, we have a city director's meeting tomorrow, virtually, like this council meeting, and that will be one of the subjects of discussion. So I thank you for bringing it to my attention. Councilor could Clark? I ask you one more piece to that? Could Mr. Louie, could I ask you, is there a possibility that stores are, they gave me the impression that they're not allowed to have people use their washrooms. Could, the, if they can use their washrooms, let, let people use them, could they not wash them and take care of them themselves, or is that something fit provincially that is being asked not to do? do so, you know that through piece your of? worship to Councillor Kalalef, I would probably have to check with, I think, tend to think that would be regional public health. So I know restaurants must provide washrooms. Other stores have washrooms. Some of them say for customer yes. use only. Some of them say for staff use only. I tend to think that it's up to the retailer's choice but I could okay. take some time to look into that and maybe give you an email after I find out the answer. I could copy all of council on the email. That would be great. That would help. Thank you. So I, for your, That's all I for have. your worship to Councillor Kalalef, I can hear the clerk whispering to me down the, down the lane here that we can also involve the BIA in that email too. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Uh, Council Borgard, did you have a question? Uh, yes, Your Worship. Actually, uh, to through you to uh, our CAO and maybe even yourself, Your Worship. Maybe you can answer this question. Has there at all been any discussion at the regional level, or have we heard anything from the provinces about a potential possibility of the region having the power to choose how it's going to open up, or, or the municipalities, the lower tier municipalities themselves, as you know, the conditions in Toronto may be different than, you know, in Port Colborne in the region. I mean, looking at the statistics, we, I, I believe, are doing very well as a region. So I'm just wondering if there's been any discussion there or if the provinces really want to just maintain that, uh, the control over it. Um, so far, I haven't heard anything at the region, uh, Council Borgard. Uh, the City of Toronto is different overall because they do have the City of Toronto Act. Um, so they are kind of separate uh, as opposed to the rest of the province but nothing has been brought up in any of my weekly mayor's meetings and the regional chair is involved with those. So I haven't heard that yet and I haven't received any information through the ministry. Uh, the city and myself receive uh, emails all the time. Um, a lot of that is passed on to you guys through reports uh, uh, from uh, the CAO. Uh, but the, the clerk has a comment on this, so I'll allow her to go here. Uh, good evening. The information we've received from the Provincial Emergency Operations Centre uh, has been that they will not be taking a regional approach to reopening at this time. Uh, and the simple reason uh, with that it was explained to me is if Toronto is still uh, has a high number of cases, but Niagara Region has opened up, you're going to get the influx of Toronto citizens uh, wanting to come down and enjoy our amenities. So keeping it closed province-wide is their uh, response right now. 
Um, that being said, uh, regionally, we are working together quite a bit, just as the mayor said. Um, the mayors are all talking, um, every level of staff, the CAOs are talking, the emergency groups are talking uh, to make sure that our responses are um, equitable and equal and uh, we're all working together. Okay. Mr. Louis, do you have anything to add? Um, no. Yeah, through your worship to Councillor Beauregard, uh, I think it's sort of been said here, uh, the communication, I can't begin to tell you how well the cities and towns in Niagara are working together. Um, there's general consensus and agreement. Sometimes somebody has to do something that's tailor-made to their own municipality, but we're all moving forward very, very closely. But I do agree with the point about um, consistency across the province and other jurisdictions because we did, and this is one of the things that we considered, and I know council's not aware of all of these because of our council meeting schedule, but and some of them are operational, not policy, but the boat ramp itself, when we it was closed in April, because it doesn't open until May, but it wasn't blockaded, it wasn't barricaded, and we had people phoning from Toronto, Oakville, Mississauga, can I put my boat in your boat ramp? And so we knew that we would not only have local pressure, but external pressure as well, and that's when the city made the decision to barricade it. Now, of course, when Ford, the province, permitted us to open it, we opened it, as did other jurisdictions, so we knew we weren't going to get that outside pressure and it's very hard to regulate users on a free, you know, what, at the time the, the boat ramp didn't have the meter installed because it was off season, on a free city asset. So for that reason, I would suggest that, that we're continuing to watch the province's announcements and let them guide us. Thank you, Council Borgard. Thank you for all your comments. Uh, it's very informative, thanks. Thank you, any further questions, comments? I already asked Councillor Demery, so she's fine. Please raise your hand if you're in favor. That is carried unanimously. Thank you, Council. We'll now proceed with item number four, Engineering and Operations Department, Operations Division Report 2020-58. Subject, Drinking Water Quality Management System Part 1 Management Review Summary. Our mover is Councillor Baggu. Our seconder is Councillor Demeray. We have um, uh, Darlene Sutter on the system. Darlene, did you want to give an overview of this or do you just want to take questions? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I can just take questions uh, from council. Great, thank you, Darlene. Uh, council, uh, questions? Please raise your hand if you have a question on this one. I don't see any questions, any comments. Oh, sorry, Councillor Demery, no questions? No, okay. Uh, comments? Councillor Baggy. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, to you, Mr. Mayor, in the, in the very good, excellent report and the management review, it stated that uh, the region's leak detection on the trunk water mains is still ongoing. The region hasn't committed to doing any uh, leak detection. And I was just hoping that yourself and uh, Regional Council Butters could uh, keep the pressure on the region. I know it's, I think it's still at committee level though, but you get these leak detections done by the, on the regional truck lines. That's all. Thank you, Councillor Baggu. Um, Darlene, do you have a comment on that? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I know it was just brought up during our management review. It was asked by the councillors, to our knowledge, if the region had done any leak detection. Um, it is, I believe, something that um, our director brings up at public works officials meetings. Um, but yeah, if uh, our councillors want to bring it up at a region meeting, our staff would be happy with that. Thank you, Darlene. I do sit on public works, um, but I'll go to Mr. Lee. Uh, Chris, I know you and I have had these discussions and where do we stand with regards to the region on this issue? <clears throat> Through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and to the rest of council. Um, we're still working with the uh, water wastewater group at the region and we have some ideas. We've had some uh, technologies that have been brought forward to us. And so the intent is over the next few months to have those conversations and then see if we can somehow have them fund that through their process and make certain that um, their system is tight. Um, 
and hopefully uh, reduce, if there is anything, um, have them budget something or do those repairs as necessary. So that's an ongoing uh, discussion that we'll have with their uh, uh, director of uh, water particularly and also with wastewater. Thank you, Mr. Lee. So Councilor Bagu, so we'll continue to um, have our staff deal with the region on this. Um, that was brought to their attention a while back when Chris and I had these conversations. So as this moves forward, we'll keep you guys in tune uh, through Chris's department and then anything we need to take uh, both Councilor Butters and I can take that uh, through to uh, Public Works and to Regional Council. Any okay. further? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. That is carried unanimously. Thank you, Council. Next is item number six, Planning and Development Department Report 2020-15, Subject Community Improvement Plan Incentives, 118 West Street, Southport Condos, Inc. Mover is Councillor Bodner, seconder is Councillor Baggy. Questions, Councillors? Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the CAO or Dan Aguilina. Um, there's certainly uh, lots of dollars involved in this. And I just wondered whether we've had any other um, uh, businesses or properties take advantage of this uh, tax in incremental grant. Um, and if we could just uh, hear about those. Through your, through your worship to Councillor Bonner, I will let the land use planner, uh, director of planning, chime in on this because it is more under his umbrella. But I do know that uh, this is a substantial construction project. This has happened in the past. It happened with uh, Allied Marine, for example. Uh, it's based on when assessment is added to, to the assessment role and the, the tax increment that's created, the property tax increment. And so I know that those processes have happened in the past. I think this one's particularly eye-catching because of the, the value of the construction. And I think Director Aquilina can fill us in on the uh, process that is followed to, uh, I don't know, I guess process these applications. Mr. Aquilina. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to Councillor Bodner. That is correct. As the CAO had mentioned, the last applicant that we had to take advantage of the tax increment financing is a different community improvement plan, but that was for Allied Marines expansion on the east side of the canal. That was under the Gateway CIP. So this application is twofold. It's taking advantage of the downtown CIP as well as the Brownfield CIP. And as the report talks about, I would like to make a correction. They are proposing 76 units residential purposes so there was an error in the report it indicated there was 53 and the other section it, it talks about 72 i believe and that is inaccurate it is in fact 76 units councillor bodner thank you dan thank you mr mayor i think this is a fabulous project i just wanted people to um not think that this was a one-off for this developer um, and that this is common practice, albeit the, the CAO said it, it is very large dollar amounts, but to get this off the ground, it's just fabulous and, uh, and I'm certainly in support of it. Thank you, Councillor. Any further questions on this item? Councillor Wells. Thank you, Your Worship. It's not so much a question, just a, a comment to Dan. Uh, you may want to check the uh, table. I believe there's a, uh, one of the numbers in the report um, is wrong. It's uh, stated a uh, number in the first column, the total. Uh, if you could just check that, just to make a correction on that. Okay, 
Uh, so, Mr. Aquilina and the CAO, we can deal with that. Yep. Mr. Mr. Mayor, if I can, this is a draft agreement. It still needs to be signed, but in essence, the nature of the application is to allow this development to move forward. We still need to have the region of Niagara on board as well, because it also has a regional tax component. Okay. Councillor Demery, did you have a question? No, I don't. Thank you. Any further questions? All those in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed? That's carried unanimously. Um, we'll go back to item five. I apologize, Councillor uh, Beauregard. Um, item five is Engineering and Operations Department Engineering Division Report 2020-62. Subject project number 2015-04. Citywide grass mowing contract extension. Councillor Beauregard uh, has asked this to be brought on the table. Uh, can I get a seconder to this? Uh, Councillor Bodner. Councillor Beauregard. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, so, through you to staff, uh, my question is I thought, based on my understanding, I, I understand that we have and in, we're doing an in-house uh, lawn mowing, correct? Um, how, like, do we need to continue on with having a private contractor as well as the in-house? Uh, any comments on that would be appreciated. Thank you, Councillor. Mr. Lee? <clears throat> Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Beauregard and the rest of Council. Um, the city has had a private contractor do the roadside mowing for probably the last uh, 15 to 16 years. So all this is is a continuation of that contract. The, under, the mowing that you refer to in-house is done strictly within the parks, except for some of the boulevards that our roads crews do. And as uh, was alluded to in the earlier conversations with CAO Louie, um, with the staff cuts and those students, uh, those cuts are actually being decreased because we just don't have enough bodies to do those boulevards, that, and I'm referring to the small boulevard areas. This contract um, is in specific reference to um, grass cutting in the rural area specifically, with a few areas within Ward 3, but more of a rural section. Councilor Borgard. Okay, um, thank you, Chris. Uh, I'm just wondering whether or not it's whether we plan on maybe moving for like 100% in-house or is that something that we have, may have discussions later on? Um, I'm yeah. just, go ahead. To you, Councillor Beauregard, uh, through, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we actually had a proposal in the original budget uh, submissions to council, but through the process of trying to speed it up and with COVID and all of the meeting restrictions, those budget considerations weren't brought to the table. Uh, Staff had actually brought a proposal forward with three different options and the costings associated with that. And our intent is that in 2021, hopefully everything will be much uh, more open and easier for us to present those and we can have those open discussions. And the intent is uh, the recommendation will be then at that time. Uh, I've had this discussion with a couple of the Ward 4 counselors, specifically Councillor Wells and Councillor Bodner, and they were looking at the rural roadside mowing being taken over um, and doing an analysis of that and seeing if we can do it in-house. So that was a proposal that we put forward, but that budget package never came in front of council because of us trying to speed that process up with all the limitations of the pandemic. Councilor? Okay, thank you, Chris. Yeah, I was just wondering what, whether or not, yeah, that was our intention was to move to 100% um, in-house. And as it sounds, we, we do need to have uh, a private contractor at this time. So thank you. That, that thank you. Any further questions? Councilor Demery, do you have a question? I don't. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, all those in favor, please raise their hand. That is carried unanimously. Thank you, Council. We'll now move on with item number seven, Planning and Development Department Planning Division Report 2020-59, 
Subject mineral, mineral Aggregate Operations Zone. A mover was Councillor Damaris, and our seconder is Councillor Bodner. Questions to staff on this one? Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I believe there was a letter um, that was uh, brought forward by Mr. Halenga and uh, made part of our package, I believe. Um, I just wondered that this seems to be an ongoing issue in clarity as to um, how we should word this. And um, it doesn't seem too complicated to me if we could just add the actual words uh, from Mr. Um, Halinga's uh, letter uh, at the bottom where he talks about uh, mineral aggregate operations and that he would like to actually spell out that asphalt, uh, cement, and secondary related uh, products um, should be actually mentioned in there. Um, I just wonder through you to Mr. Aguilina, um, how we felt about this. Do, do we have to spell this out? Um, it just seems to be an ongoing issue of clarity. Mr. Aquilina. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Councillor Bonner. I as well just received those comments today and I'm not sure if council wants me to address those now or if in a subsequent report to council. My feeling with all this, it's a matter of interpretation which I believe that the public has some apprehension with my interpretation, unless the words are spelled black and white. Yeah, I, Mr. Mayor, can I yep. go? Go ahead. Okay, so I think, I don't have any problem with your interpretation of it, but yeah, there is a, there is a feeling out there that, that that wording should actually be in there. Now, if you're coming back with this, um, okay, I think there's other comments. I'll just wait uh, and hear a couple other comments before I, I decide if I'll make a recommendation or not. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Demery, I know you uh, had your hand up and I believe you're bringing that uh, letter forward. I am. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I did speak with Mr. Halenga again today and uh, I to told him that I would read his comments into the record, which is what he would like to have done. And I told him I would do that because I believe, I 100% I, I agree with him on this. Clarity isn't there and I do believe it needs to be. Um, so I, if everybody would just uh, allow me, I will just uh, read his comments. He says, I am responding to the above report in included at pages 115 to 118 of the council package of May 25th, 2020. It should be noted at the outset that there, that there has, to my knowledge, been never been a suggestion that asphalt and concrete recycling be banned in all zones. The contention has always been that it, that the location or zone should be appropriately des designated, including that, including and particularly the, pro the proximity to groundwater, the ground water table, sorry, and sensitive land uses. In, quoting, in the quoting of section 39, noxious uses of the consolidated zoning bylaw, I am both curious and concerned about the definition of noxious, noxious uses in particular, uh, where it says noxious use means um, a use which creates an adverse effect throughout through the generation of noise, vibration, dust, fumes, gas, odor, waste, hazardous waste, emissions, smoke, glare, radiation, electrical interference, or any use involving the use of sh uh, or storage of hazardous, toxic or contaminant substances, which constitutes a real uh, a threat to public health or safety, or any use that is not lawfully permitted in the province of Ontario, or a combination thereof, but excluding normal agriculture and, la and agricultural and la livestock operations and normal aggregate resource operations in a licensed pit or quarry. Okay, the duplicate is taken from the uh, 
Planning and Development Report 2020-59, uh, where it's the exclusion allows normal aggregate resources op resource operations. Uh, the Aggregate Resource Act has included aggregate recycling as, as a promoted use in aggregate operations. So recycling of asphalt and concrete is a normal aggregate resource operation. We support recycling of asphalt and concrete if done appropriately as it decreases the demand for virgin ag aggregate. In section 28, mineral uh, aggregate operation zone of the, uh, of the, um, sorry, yeah, of the consolidated zoning bylaw, permitted uses include MAO operations and the MAO, MAO definition also includes aggregate recycling. Um, and aggregate mineral aggregate operations means an operation other than wayside pits and quarries conducted under a license or permit, the Aggregate Resources Act or su successors thereto. Um, also associated uh, accessory facilities used in extraction, transport, benefication, processing, or recycling of mineral aggregate resources. The consolidated zoning bylaw must read and be applied as a whole. I would ask that the, that the precedence of the various sections and clauses be established because of the conflicting clauses allowing or prohibiting particular act, uh, activities, particularly in the MAO, MAO zone. I would suggest the priority of clauses is usually understood to be um, one definition, two exceptions slash exemptions within clauses, three specific clauses and sections, four general clauses and sections. On this basis, aggregate re recycling and asphalt production and concrete batching are not prohibited uses. But as stated at the outset, it has never been suggested that certain activities be banned completely. The emphasis is and, and has always been on ensuring the protection of the environment, including the high vulnerable aquifer, which becomes more vulnerable when the overburden is removed and when quarrying extends into the aquifer. Going back to the recommendations made on April 23rd, 2018, it was, con it was concern over the location of particular potentially contaminated, uh, contaminating operations and the adverse environmental effects from those operations. It was for the, this reason that Council of the Day passed the interim control bylaw. Uh, and it is for this, this reason we have been seeking to ensure that the consolidation, the consolidated zoning bylaw reflect the interim control bylaw to precisely identify permitted and prohibited uses. In this instance, the simple solution for amendment of the, of the consolidated zoning bylaw is one, leave the uses prohibited in all zones as is. Two, leave section 39 Knox's uses definition as is. Three, leave the definition of the of MAO as is. Four, leave section 28 MAO zone uh, 28.2 permitted uses as is. Except add to um, a, miner a mineral op aggregate operations, except the manufacturing of asphalt, cement, and secondary related products, and proce processing or recycling of asphalt, cement, and secondary related products within two meters of the groundwater table of the aquifer um, and where runoff may enter the aquifers. Lastly, if asphalt recycling is a noxious operation and it is permitted, it is prohibited within the, control, the consolidated zoning bylaw, why was no action taken in 2018 and 2019 when this process was being conducted on the floor of pit one? Respectfully submitted, Jack S. Hillinga, 770 Highway 3, Port Colbert. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Mr. Okay. Louis? Uh, for your worship to Council, I mean, um, based on Based on the planner's comments, the director's comments that it's a difference of opinion and it's a question of what's black and white in the, in the um, consolidated zoning bylaw. I mean, I can only sort of foresee a few courses of action and I'm not sure if the director will agree with me. I, I, I'm reluctant to enter into a scenario where 
we're pitting council against staff or the public against staff, but it's almost like we want a resolution and we almost want a tiebreaker vote here. So I think it's a case where council needs to support the current wording in the planner's position, direct the planner to revise the wording to match the public request, or I mean, it, it could be a case where we ask staff to take this to legal or we ask staff to take this to a planning consultant for an er interpretation and bring that back to council and let council decide on the merits of the public opinion, the staff opinion, and the outside consultant's opinion. Uh, I don't know if the director would agree with that third course of action as a possible path forward that can get everyone on the same page. Mr. Aquilina? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to all of council. I'm at the pleasure of council. I don't want to have the fear from the public that you're going to have an asphalt manufacturing plant in the core or in the mineral aggregate operations zone. So I am fine with making the changes that are being requested from council. It's just a matter of what the process is going to be, given the fact we're in the COVID era that we're in. There could be something that could be brought forward. I'm not adverse to spending taxpayers' money, but I wouldn't want to actually engage an outside consultant because that consultant is gonna hear and say what you want him to say. So that's my opinion of things. So I, I think I could save the city money and just move forward with making those requested changes for council. Okay, I have Councilor Demery, then Councilor Bruno. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Mr. Aquilina. I, I, I really do believe that that is what should happen, that, that this is the proper wordage to go in. And this makes everything very clear, very well defined. Um, and I think it's something that everybody has a, a, a measure of uh, comfort with. Um, it'll bring us into the future safely. So my, my question is to the clerk, um, how do we go about making sure that this, this can happen? I was prepared to put a motion on the, on the floor if that's what's needed, but uh, I'll, I'll take your advice. Madam Clerk. Uh, yes, you can amend the motion to receive the information, uh, amend it to include uh, the recommendation from Jack Halinka. Uh, you just need to be very specific about what you want to include. It does uh, lay out what Jack requests, and you'll just need to include that. Councillor Demeray? Okay, I thank you. Then um, I would like to move that. Um, I would like to put a, a, an amendment on the, on the table then. Um, Coming back to Mr. Halenga's page two, um, where we have uh, in this instance the simple solution for uh, amendment of the control the consolidated zoning bylaw is from that from that point to the um, the point where uh, we have the mi mineral aggregate operations. Uh, quote, that's it. Should I just read the whole thing out again or is we, are we okay with taking it right off the paper just as it is? Uh, the clerk says she's clear on this. Okay, good. Okay, so I have a mover of this. Can I get a seconder for this amendment? Councillor Bodner. <coughs> Questions to the amendment? Councillor Bruno. Thank you, Worship. I'm agnostic as far as all those details as to whether they're good, right, or indifferent. I'm more concerned with, um, I don't want to hire a consultant to say if everything that uh, Councillor Demeray has put forward is, you know, what I, what I would really like, because just it's been my experience so far that That, that often this can become how we will deal with all amendments going forward or all measures of, of clarity going forward. So I'm not, I'm not a, opposed to doing it. I would have liked to have heard an opinion of the pros and cons from doing detail itemized stuff and I was thinking that was more legal than a consultant on environmental matters because I would want to treat 
the next time someone would want to enunciate things into a certain level of detail as that's the way we're going or, or, or not. Because I'm, I'm with the counselor on clarity and understanding is better than the alternative. But is this a process that we should be doing going forward? Because I, I couldn't see providing all that clarity on this one and then not doing it the next time or vice versa. That's what I'm more interested in. I'm more interested that we get, um, is there an issue with every time deep diving into this on an item by item basis? So I, I still would like to get that opinion. And then I think we set the stage for going forward. Thank you, Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I agree with Councillor Bruno that we don't want to start, you know, a process where it just, it's a big thing every time. But this has been a flashpoint and a, and a hot button issue in my ward. And there's real concerns out there and people want to hear things kind of black and white. Like they can understand if it's, if it says very clearly that it's prohibited. If they're supposed to make assumptions and, and, um, and trust uh, the planner that it's in there and believe me, I would take the planner over anybody who's not an expert, um, but I need to, Mr. Mayor, if I can ask Dan, if we put, Dan, if we put this in the way Mr. Halinga has written it, will it fundamentally change anything that you've been uh, promoting or any um, comfort level you have with your report? Mr. Aquilina? You, Mr. Mayor, through you to Councillor Bonner, I have not had any discussion about any future asphalt manufacturing plant. And to assure council that what I said, if one was proposed, it would come back to council for both an official plan and a zoning bylaw change. If the comments from Mr. Olinga would like, if council would like me to address those comments by way of an application for a zoning change, I will make that happen. And the concerns that we could have for legal, I don't see those concerns. We're just ensuring that the zoning bylaw reflects what I've told council is factual. So if it's a matter of making it more clear to have the public's trust in things, I'm more than happy to make that happen. Mr. Mayor, I think that's the words of a very wise uh, man. Um, <laughs> You know, it, it, we're not trying to go against anything that Dan's saying. We just want clarity. It's easy to say, there it is, black and white. Um, we're good to go. And I certainly wouldn't want to get four planners in a room and ask their opinions because been there, done that. There certainly will be four <laughs> opinions and we'll just be back to square one. So I think Dan has said it exactly the way it should be. And I'm more than happy with his comments on that. Okay, thank you, Councillor Bonner. So, Mr. Aquilina, just to be clear that you're fine with the amendment that Councillor Demaray has brought forward to you uh, to accept that so that it would be written in at that at going forward? That, that's correct, Mr. Mayor. I will review those comments and I'll be sure that the application going forward reflects those requested changes. Okay, Council's clear on that? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Any further questions on the amendment? Seeing none, raise your hand. All those in favor? That's carried unanimously. Now the motion as amended. Any questions on that? Which is primarily the same thing. So, uh, but anybody have further comments or questions? Seeing none, voting on the motion as amended. All those in favor? Again, that's unanimous. Thank you, Council.
will now proceed. Oh, do you want to get the other counselors back? There were some conflicts. Further branch. Harry's back. There's Harry. Okay. They're all back. Thank you, Madam Deputy Clerk. Uh, proceed with item number nine, Planning and Development Department Bylaw Enforcement Division, Report 2020-64, Subject Parking and Traffic, Nickel Street, Mover is Councillor Beauregard, Seconder is Councillor Demeray. Questions on this item? Any questions? Please raise your hand. Councillor Beauregard. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, my question to Dan is essentially what 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 was it that caused sorry what was it that has caused this to be to be asked for I I guess is it um, yeah sorry if you could just elaborate on that okay Mr. Aquilina thank you Mr. Mayor through you to Councillor Beauregard you were approached by the owner of the business that operates the laundry facility. And he raised the fact that he does not have spaces available for his customers to park. So he requested, is there anything that can be done? And so staff said, yes, there is. And that's why you have the report before you to put a two hour time limit to help out the business owner. Council Borgard. Has this been an issue that's been ongoing for many years or is this something that's really just very recent and top of mind at this point in time? Mr. Aquilina? Mayor, to counsel, through you to Councillor Beauregard, I'm not familiar if it has been an issue. I know the laundry mat has been there for quite a while, but this is the first request that has been made from the property owner to actually put something in place. So the history that it's been, I'm gonna say it hasn't been an issue because it would have been something that would have been brought forward to Councillor previously. All right, Councillor Beauregard. Yeah, through your worship. Um, so, is what should we? Has there been any discussion about putting it maybe on the less busy street instead of Nickel Street? Maybe going on Ferris. Is that would that be a possibility? Mr. Aquilina, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Beauregard. The manager of bylaw enforcement authored the report and came up with the recommendation to do the two-hour time limit on Nickel Street. If council would like me to go back to the manager, I could do that and report back to council. Council Borgard. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, that might be something I, I may put forward, but uh, my, my, my other question is, it just seems like this is really, he, the, the business owner is doing this because of the tenants next door, if, as I see in the report and um, uh, that may be just a temporary time. And I don't know of any other place really close to this business where we have uh, parking meters. It just, it, it's re really a very unique uh, situation in this part of town. And um, yeah, that's kind of my thoughts on that. Uh, I also want to say that one thing that I'm not, I haven't been impressed with in my walks around this area is the business owner has put signs up that says uh, no parking in front unless you're there for the laundromat. And that is not, to the best of my knowledge, uh, true. Anyone could park there until we do this parking signs, but they do not have the authority to tell people who can and cannot park there. So I'm just, I, haven't, I was not impressed with that by any means. And I received complaints about it. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Demeray. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to maybe uh, add a little clarification to this. Um, it isn't unusual for business owners in the area to request parking. Um, I've actually had requested that we have parking signs, 15-minute um, parking signs removed from certain areas after the businesses have, have left and the uh, spots have made, remained vacant for some time. That would be like on Mitchell Street, the old bakery and that sort of thing. Um, so business owners do this quite a lot. Uh, it's not unusual at all. Um, but to move it around on Ferris Street would be really unfair to those residences that are there. Um, they, they sometimes need those parking spots. So, and for people using the park across the road, 
that may be a bit of a difficulty. So to for a business owner to ask for parking specifically in front of his business, I think would be the, the best way to deal with it. Um, it. But I wouldn't say a block's worth, just a few spaces are fine. That's all I had to say. Thank you, Councillor. Any further questions? Councillor Borgard? Through, through, through your worship, uh, and I, I agree with you, Angie, uh, uh, Councillor Demeray, and um, the same point that you made before about, you know, some people need those, those spaces. The uh, residents that are right next to the laundromat, there's, I would, I believe there are multiple people that live there. It's an apartment, uh, I believe, and they wouldn't be able to have the parking in front of there because they can't park in front of their driveway. And then if you look next to it, adjacent to their units, uh, there's the regional plant so they can't park there or i believe in front of the other building so it would be quite a ways away as well so that's also a little bit of a concern of mine okay thank you councillor further questions comments councillor demaray uh no i i'm fine with that i i, I understand what councillor borgard is, is uh, talking about um those were previously rented for no parking spots but yeah that's the above, above the laundromat you're talking about so that that would make sense as far as those residences go but uh, either way i i do know that that business is having a problem so okay thank you any further questions seeing none please raise your hand all those in favor oh councillor Beauregard. sorry Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I would like to put forward an amendment to maybe only include one parking space that's time there. So at least one space, the, the one furthest to the east uh, be removed so that there could be parking for anyone that wants to park there. But there would still be one spot uh, for those who are using the laundromat. Okay, so I have an amendment. Can I get a seconder to that? Councillor Demaray. The amendment is to remove the uh easterly parking space and leave the westerly parking space correct councillor correct okay any questions to the amendment all those in favor of the amendment please raise your hand all those opposed that is carried so now to the motion as amended any further questions Please raise your hand. All those in favor? All those opposed? That's carried. Thank you. We'll now go to item number 10, Corporate Services Department Finance Division Report 2020-61, Subject 2020 Final Tax Rates. Mover, Councillor Bagu, seconder, Councillor Demeray. Those that are asking, I know Councillor Bagu has a question. I'll start with him. Councillor Bagu. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Just pulling up on the other computer here. It's tough to do. Um, basically, I got no problem with the report, but I do have somewhat of a problem with the due dates of the uh, final tax bill being July 2nd and October 1st. So I can wait for other councillors to talk about it. I'm sure they will, and uh, maybe come back. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do you want to answer that, Scott? Yeah. So through your worship to Councillor Baggio, I think that uh, we'll treat that as the first question because I don't know if anyone else wants to speak about this report. Um, based on my conversations with the clerk's department today, I think you're the only councillor. So we looked at it, and I assume you're talking about the pandemic and the economic effects of the pandemic on our taxpayers and their ability to pay. So on that assumption, I can report <clears throat> that we did put in place the interest and penalty waiver for the last uh, due date, which was really for um, the end of March, the end of April, and the end of May, which is coming up here. So interest and penalty is put on property tax accounts the first few days of the month, and it's for the month prior. It's put on, on a monthly basis. And as one of our, I guess, um, reactions or responses to the pandemic, we gave taxpayers who didn't have the ability to pay a, pe an, a penalty and interest waiver for every month. And I can report to council 
that we actually, in fact, collected on the April 3rd, or sorry, May 1st, our, our, our taxes are due May 1st, uh, we actually collected about 1% more of the outstanding taxes than we did last year. We're collecting at around 85%, and in the past, 84%, um, which tells me that there is a large element of our population that is able to pay even with the pandemic in place. So if council wants to take, the, so that uh, penalty interest waiver has since been extended by the mayor with his delegated authority from council to June 30th. Um, council could certainly choose to extend that waiver longer. The mayor could choose to do it with his delegated authority longer, or council could change the due dates to give taxpayers more time to pay and not continue the waiver of penalty and interest. And that might in fact be the best way to go because when you're giving the penalty and interest waiver, you're really giving it to 15% of the population who weren't paying their tax probably uh, for financial reasons, business reasons, whatever the case is that were unrelated to the pandemic since that's our historic rate of uncollectible taxes. So they do pay eventually, they just don't always pay on time. And we're also giving people a discount on penalty and interest that's associated with taxes that are outstanding from 2019, 2018, and so on. So some of those people are taking advantage of a program that council's put in place as a pandemic response, when in fact is there back taxes that are not related to the pandemic. So I think you have three options here. Option one is the status quo, which is the penalty and interest waiver is only until June 30th and the tax due dates stay the same. Option two is extending the penalty waiver longer, which has the effect of making the taxes not payable. So that means when they're due on July 1st, if that's the right date, July 2nd, um, <clears throat> a person could not pay because they're laid off from their job and will not be subject to penalty and interest. If they're recalled to their job in August, September, October, they can pay at that time without accruing any interest. The third option is to let the penalty waiver lapse, so we'll start applying penalty to outstanding tax amounts, but to change the due dates to be later in the year. So for example, the July payment could be 60 days later, well, the October one couldn't be 60 days later because it would be in the new year. But we could give 30 extra days or 45 extra days um, to, on the due date the problem is there's never a good time to pay taxes. Eventually you'll be close to Christmas and counts, or sorry, the public will say it's not a good time of year to pay taxes and so on. So I think that, uh, I think the recommendation before council is to leave the two tax due dates the same, but we'd be following whatever direction council gave us in terms of an amendment. Thank you, Mr. CAO. Um, I think I'd like to stick with these dates, although like we've done already, through my office and in consultation with staff and the CAO is that I was able to extend it to the June 30th. But I'd rather co consult with council, leave the dates as they always are because that's how the report would come, normally would come forward to us, but we can waive the, the, um, the late fees to a, a date further down the line. Um, I don't see everything opening up uh, in the next number of weeks, but I think that's something we can do very quickly uh, through the mayor's office, but I'd rather consult with you guys on how to move forward. So I'd, I, if we can pass this like it stands, but allow uh, through the mayor and the CAO to take that June 30th date and extend it out, but again with your uh, consultation. Is that is that fine, Council? Um, comments on that? Councillor Bodner? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think that's... Uh what you said is just the way we should go. Uh, it gives the option for us to react quickly um, through your office. And um, I, I don't see any problem with that whatsoever. Okay. Thank you. Count Councillor Bruno, you had your hand up. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I too agree with your, um, your sentiments on moving the interest deadline for two reasons. One is I think we have to remember that our interest and penalty um, uh, deferral or holiday is also in lockstep with our water bills. And perhaps there may even be others. So I think we should A, be consistent um, and move with how um, 
others are moving and the degree of people coming back to work. And secondly, I think if you move the um, tax due date, you're also affecting your cash flow. And if 85% of the people are paying that uh, at the original due date, you're not digging deeper into right our, um, our line of credit. And so that's actually a money savings for us. So I would agree that I think it should just be in tandem with how we're doing water and other things in terms of the interest uh, and penalty holiday. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor, because I do have a meeting on Wednesday morning with our mayors and uh, the regional chair. So I will bring that up there to see what everybody else is doing. I'm sure because basically uh, I believe all municipalities went to June 30th. So I'll just double check with my fellow mayors and, and the regional chair to see how uh, they're looking to rolling things further. Um, but again, in consulting with you guys, I think is the best route to follow. Any further questions? Councillor Baggio, are you fine with that? Oh, yeah, I'm good with it. Thank you very much. Yeah, because I, I think it gives you what you want because uh, we're leaving our normal dates, but it gives you so that they're not charged the interest. So, okay, I'll, um, oh, yeah, sorry. I am interrupting the, uh, through the mayor to council. I just want to make it clear. Uh, you will get phone calls and emails, or you have in the past with the past due date. This has the net effect of being, in fact, a, a, a waiver of the due date because a person could skip the payment and have no penalty. There's no fee for that. And that does help the people in our community who have been impacted by the pandemic, and that's important. But it is, it is an active, it is not a changing of the due dates, and we have had residents whose taxes are still coming out of their bank if they're on automatic payments, we are not actively stopping those bank payments from coming out. In fact, we encourage those who have the ability to pay to send their money in because the city does have um, you know, a line of credit that we use when our account is overdrawn and that, is, that also impacts the budget and impacts tax rates. So if a person is on pre-authorized payments or if a person is... Um, is counting on this as meaning taxes aren't due. That's not how it works. So you will get those phone calls and you'll have to explain that. So. Thank you, uh, Scott. And I, I just want to say to the community that, you know, we are very appreciative for those that can pay. Also, we've had a number of people contact our staff here at City Hall to talk about their bills, uh, whether it be taxes or their water and sewer bills. So, um, and, and that's, that's the best route to go is, is to contact our staff and discuss it. Um, on, on our payment options that we have um, available to you. But I, again, I just want to congratulate our community on how they've been moving forward uh, through this. And again, as I've stated time and time again, we are here to work with our public uh, in any way we can. Um, but I think these uh, actions that we've done so far have worked. And I'd like to continue that route because it is a proven method. So uh, if there's no more further questions, I don't see any further questions. All those in favor, please raise your hand. That's unanimous. Thank you, Council. So, Council, I'll have an email sent out to everybody for comment um, in the, after my meeting with the mayors, and then we can uh, move forward with that. So, thank you again. Uh, item number 11, ADR Chambers Integrity Commissioner Office for the City of Port Coburn, re-complaint reference number IC-184-0220, filed February 28, 2020, Ron Barda and Councillor Ron Bodner, mover is Councillor Bruno, seconder is Councillor Demeray, uh, questions Councillor uh, Bruno. Uh, thank you, Worship. I read with great interest that report looks uh, uh, weighty, lengthy, but thorough. Um, I've got two questions and then a comment. One is um, the cost of a report like this to the municipality. I'm wondering if you could indicate that and uh, if that could be maybe the, the clerk's office, uh, uh, as well as the cost to date of our um, Integrity Commission's report. And I think the public should know it. In some cases, councillors ask for the advice. In some cases, citizens um, want to know. And I just like to look at what 
the overall impact of that has been to date. Because I know in our budgets, and this is a relatively new thing in Ontario, we did put money aside for that. And so I'm just wondering where we're at with this one and cumulatively, if you could uh, give some idea of that. And then I have a final comment. Madam Clerk. Uh, through the mayor. Uh, so our integrity commissioner uh, reports that are lengthy like this one uh, range about seventeen to twenty thousand uh, dollars. Our advice given to councillors, uh, there has been a number of requests for advice, um, and they range uh, several hundred dollars into thousand uh, dollars approximately. Uh, originally, we did not increase our budget. We have been using legal fees. Uh, because we didn't know what uh, the price was going to be of these reports. Uh, the reality is we can go years without uh, full investigations, uh, with just with advice, and then some years we could have uh, multiple investigations. So uh, council will expect an uh, increase in our legal fees uh, in the budget going forward. Councilor Bruno. Thank you. Um, Madam Clerk, do you know what the cost would be today, roughly? Uh, I do not have the total, uh, but I would say approximately twenty thousand dollars this year has been spent already. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said that's what it was for this report. Um, each report is between seventeen and twenty thousand dollars. Uh, and how many investigations? We, and how many have we had? Uh, two. Okay. Thank you. Um, the, the the question I wanted to ask is, I mean, I actually think that the. Uh, um, Really, is there any way to mitigate those costs without, and I think this is important, deterring the, the positive attributes of ensuring citizens and councillors' right to uh, make sure that challenges and compliance by elected officials is not limited by their financial concerns? Because I think it's been helpful for councillors who want to see if they have a conflict or get clarity, and I think it's important for citizens to be able um, to have that right to ask those questions. But I'm wondering if without damaging that principle, if there's a, any thoughts that you've had after living through a year of this as to way, ways that might be mitigated. And in other words, could there be an early mediation, an early jumping off point? Does it have to be in the full blown written report if both sides agree? I'm just looking to see if there's anything that we could do to uh, help on the cost side. Madam Clerk. Uh, through the mayor, uh, this is difficult, um, a difficult situation I have been uh, looking over as well because it is costly. Uh, the goal is to provide transparency for the public uh, and it's something that was legislatively implemented uh, at the beginning of last year. Uh, and while the goal is great, uh, it does come at a price. Uh, the integrity commissioner is an impartial third party, uh, and so uh, that is part of the cost uh, because it isn't someone uh, that is within our municipality. Uh, to mitigate the price, I will say that multiple municipalities in the region went together uh, to bid for the uh, integrity commissioner, uh, so it is the lowest price we uh, were able to receive. And I do have all of the uh, complaints coming through my office at the moment. Uh, and that is because uh, most often when people want an integrity commissioner uh, to evaluate their situation, uh, they don't actually need that. Uh, they are just frustrated and need answers to their questions. And I do try to mitigate that and get the answers without going through the full process. Uh, also, the integrity commissioner does evaluate uh, each investigation and doesn't always go forward with the full investigation, uh, only when okay. he warrants uh, it necessary. Councilor Bruno. Thank you, Madam Clerk. That was very enlightening. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilor Beauregard. Through your worship, uh, maybe to um, our clerk, do you, is there a way that we can maybe deflect certain questions or issues to the ombudsman, which is a way that we would be able to avoid such costs? Uh, I'm not, I, I think I know the answer to this question, but maybe, maybe you can enlighten me on that. Uh, through the mayor, uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, so the ombudsman uh, works, uh, is provincially uh, recognized, and he deals with uh, our closed media investigations, uh, as well as conflicts, uh, specifically with staff, um, uh, when there's issues that a 
member of the public, they don't think they got uh, correct service from the public, they're able to launch a complaint. Uh, and that is uh, not under our budget, that falls under the provincial budget. Uh, the Integrity Commissioner deals with the, um, the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, as well as our code of conduct, and how uh, councillors uh, act with each other uh, during meetings uh, and to the public and to staff. Councillor Borgard? That's all, thanks. Thank you. Councillor Wells? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this is through you to Amber. Uh, in the complaint process, uh, there is a, a question that's posed to the com complaint uh, complaint or that uh, it asked them if there had been any attempts to uh, um, uh, come to a, an agreement between the two parties prior to or prior to filing the complaint or during the complaint process. Is there any possibility that? Um, and I'm sorry, Amber, but is there any possibility that you could act as an arbitrator between these two to try to bring those two parties together to come up with a uh, mutual agreement be prior to um, going through the IC? Uh, Clerk? Through the mayor, I do attempt to do that uh, by having uh, the conflicts requests come to me, uh, but ultimately it is the decision of the complainant. Uh, it is a confidential process, so if they would like to go directly to the integrity commissioner uh, and not uh, discuss with me, that is their right. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not uh, allowed to provide conflict of interest advice to counsel, um, or uh, uh, I, ha I must allow the uh, sorry the um, members of the public to submit complaints when necessary. Councillor Wells. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Demeray, you're fine, I assume, because you're not back on? Yep, just fine. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Just before I call the vote, I just want to read the final paragraph because this sums this up. Uh, and this is from Edward T. McDermott, the Integrity Commissioner. I accordingly find that there is nothing raised in this complaint which dissuades me from the view expressed in my letter of advice to the councillor that he has no conflict of interest concerning matters currently under contemplation contemplation which might come before council involving Pleasant Beach or Pleasant Beach Road. So I just want to make sure that's in the record because our councillor did nothing wrong. And uh, I thank the integrity commissioner for this and his work uh, on this issue. Uh, seeing no further questions, all those in favor, please raise your hand. And that is carried unanimously. Thank you, council. Item number 13, memorandum from Nancy Giles, EA to CAO and mayor and staff liaison to the grant policy committee, recommendations of grant policy committee. The mover is Councillor Bruno and the seconder is Councillor Demeray. Councillor Bruno. Thank you, Worship. As you know, these come forward twice a year uh, to the council for um, ratification or any changes. Um, well, it's notably about uh, the groups that applied and received um, those uh, grants and normally there'd be a check presentation on approval. We also, as you probably have noticed through the years, uh, always want to upgrade our policies and uh, procedures. So there's two additions that over time we're now, uh, met, we're now issuing, although this was always the case, we're putting it writing funds must be used in one year of approval and three that now three estimates be provided for an application for capital improvements. Um, just to let council know, there were more applications that are listed here that were approved, but because of COVID-19 and you'll remember one, I believe it certainly is the lighthouse tours. Well, with canal days not uh, happening, they now don't need that insurance so that grant money wouldn't go forward to them and it goes back into the fund. Um, the other one was Canada Day um, and that was for the Optimist that's been canceled. And I'm afraid for the life of me, I can't think of what the third one is. I don't know if you remember Eric or not. Oh, the art crawl counselor. Sorry, yes. The art crawl. So, that, so that was also canceled. 
One of the things that I wanted to highlight tonight with the report is with COVID, I know of a couple of applications that come in from community groups that have lost their ability to fundraise. And whilst they've tapped into some government programs for charities and nonprofits, the deadline for the second tranche or the second intake is June 30th. So I just wanted to use the, uh, if the press is still listening or people that tuning in, those groups out there that are in need of funds because of particularly now COVID, please apply. Um, there is uh, normally a, a $10,000, like one third of it is for the second tranche, but with those uh, not going forward, there's actually a little bit, there's actually more money um, available than usual. So I urge uh, you and people you know to, uh, to, to go on the website for the uh, Port Coburn uh, Fund to call Nancy Giles or email her and there is an application and the information you need on the website. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Bruno. Any further questions on this item? Comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Raise your hand. That's carried unanimously. And there was a conflict there. Please note that. Already stated. All the items. Councillor Wells is back. There he is. Okay. Thank you, councillors, uh, for those um, those that were pulled. Those items were pulled. We now move into proclamations. We have one proclamation this evening. Moved by Councillor Danch, seconded by Councillor Bruno, that the month of June, first to the thirtieth, twenty twenty, be proclaimed Seniors Month. Any questions? All those in favor, raise your hand. That's carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. We're now into councillors items. Uh, I'm going to go in alphabetical order. However, it's gonna be reverse alphabetical order this week. Um, I will start with Councillor Wells. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, no real issues. Uh, we've um, been quite quiet in Ward 4. Uh, I would like to thank Councillor Baggy for making his attendance down here and uh, very valuable. And uh, I would also like to thank operations uh, for addressing uh, road ends uh, problems with gates. Uh, we obviously have uh, some people in the uh, city that like to take gates down and cut locks and create work for us. But um, uh, I'd like to thank the operations for taking care of those. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Claylis. Any items? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I have a couple. Um, I had one item come forward and, it, and again, because of COVID, I thought it was kind of important. It may have even already been looked at. I think it's probably Mr. Lee that this needs to go to. I had a suggestion come to me, some people that are concerned about um, the how fast the trucks are now going along the corner, coming down Sugarloaf and King when they cross, cross Sugarloaf along King Street coming out of the mill. Um, there's been a lot of people using the trails over the past few weeks, and I guess that you know the, the trucks are picking up speed when they get to that corner, and there, there's a bit of concern about you know safety in that corner. I know that you talk about doing a, a kind of looking at stop signs and different things around town. I wondered if there'd been any thought of that corner needing a stop sign. Mr. Lee, <clears throat> through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Clelia. Um, that has been a topic of discussion numerous times over the last uh, 20 some odd years. The issue came down to um, the trucks having to stop on a hill and then the gearing down and the stopping for that. And when those issues were brought nice. forward to the neighborhood, they were against that idea and the sounds and the noises and everything that went with that. So that has never been pursued um, specifically because of those uh, effects, cause and effects, if you would. Um, mm -hmm. But as far as the speeding goes, that would be uh, something that we would have to bring to the attention of the uh, NRP to uh, possibly do something in that neighborhood because that is posted and that is a 50 zone. 
I'm, just, I'm not sure, Mr. Lee, if, if the speed is actually, I think it's just because they're, they're, they're getting up to speed coming to that corner. And, I, and I'm sure it's because, because that was the issue that was mentioned was the safety. There's a lot more kids on their bicycles and, and people crossing there. So like I said, I, I told them that I would bring it up for tonight and I said, perhaps it's been looked at before, but I would make you aware of the fact that, you know, there was a bit of concern there now because of so many people using the trails. Um, and on that same note, I, I'm not I'm sure Mr. Baggy is going to ask you about this as well. Um, we were just wondering th what's going on with the uh, with the railway, with Troyan Railway and the crossing on Sugarloaf further down where we had the accident last year and they were supposed to yep. fill in those tracks. Is there an update on that? Do we have a date for completion? Yep, um, actually with, with that, through uh, you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Clelia, actually to the rest of Council, um, staff, uh, we have ordered the precast concrete panels that are going to be built for that construction, reconstruction, if you would. Uh, those panels are scheduled currently for delivery in the first uh, week of June. Uh, we have yet to have a final date from GeoRail as to when they actually intend to be on site. I think that um, staff has been communicating with them back and forth to try to nail them down to a specific date, but it appears that they might be waiting until they know that the shipment is coming so that they can then um, make certain that their staff and all of the equipment and, and uh, materials that they have to bring forward to the site can be accommodated once those panels are delivered. So as I said, the panels have been ordered and we've been told that they're to be delivered the first week of June. My so concern in that is, is just is the fact that because we had an accident there, We've been well aware of it. We've been telling people it's going to be repaired. And now the nice weather's here. People are on their bikes more than ever again. It's another safety concern. And I just look at the liability for the city if we had another accident at that site. Um, I know that Councillor Baggy and I were discussing that. Yes, we were discussing that. And we were wondering, would we be held liable since it was an accident last year? We were to repair it. I know the railway hasn't held up their end of it, but we, should we have not gone forward and repaired this ourselves and waited and got our money from them if we needed to at some point? I just am um, concerned because of it. Well, to, add, to answer the liability issue, uh, yes, we would always be liable because we are the owners of the railroad and GeoRail is simply the operator for the city. Um, <clears throat> that being said, is that they have their insurances and would be, um, if there was a lawsuit, they would be part of that process and be included. But um, <clears throat> could we have done it sooner? Uh, we would have been uh, in insufficient repair for what we're going to do at the present time. Um, what we're doing now with the precast concrete system is a new system that's come out in the last uh, about two years now, where the downtime in the repair has actually decreased and going to this more permanent structure. So, so we we still don't have an actual date, a finished date for that then? We're still waiting to see when this all comes together? Correct. That is correct. We're waiting for GeoRail to verify what date they're showing up with their crews to do the actual steel work. Does it make me happy? But it sounds like there's not much we can do about that one. Um, I need another update from you as well. With, on our last meeting, I talked with you regarding Cement Plant Road and Lake Shore East, and you were talking about some signage there decreasing uh, decreasing speeds as well as a stop sign at Stanley Avenue, those two pieces that were ongoing from last year. Um, to you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Calaria, um, I'll speak to the Stanley Avenue one first. There's uh, Council should know that we have, uh, staff has authored a report specific to that intersection. Um, it didn't make it on this week's agenda. It should be on the next uh, council meeting. Uh, that being said, the staff recommendation is that the intersection of Stanley and Wood Lane uh, become a three-way stop. So that would um, alleviate what some of the potential issues are in that um, intersection that have been determined by staff. And the report will explain the details on that as to the reasons when and why. Um, with regards to the uh, cement plant and Sugarloaf intersection, uh, that's an issue ongoing, and we have to have those discussions with the Township of Waynefleet, and we have to uh, get some comment back from them because the Waynefleet involves um, the western side of that intersection, and the City of Port Colburn um, shares the southbound section with the Township of Waynefleet. So 
But it wasn't, it wasn't actually traffic. the intersection that they were talking about. That was about speeding on Cement Plant Road oh, that they I'm have sorry. along that road. I, I and they were, we were looking at that for the intersection itself and the control. Yeah, we were looking at Lakeshore East, and we talked about that being Wayne Fleet, but we also talked about looking at um, decreasing the speed on that road, Cement Plant Road, because uh, it, it, first of all, they were going to dry, try to do increased um, surveillance on it by the police, as well as decreasing. You said decreasing the speed limit on it, perhaps. Yes, well, the decreased speed limit, um, that's one of the areas uh, that we are looking at, as well as on Stanley. If you remember, there were some discussions mm -hmm. on possibly lowering the speed limit on Stanley. Uh, those speed limit adjustments will be addressed in the um, traffic study that's being uh, undertaken this year by the engineering group. And there are a number of areas where the speeds are of concern. Um, as you mentioned, Sugar Hill, um, or I'm sorry, Stanley, uh, you mentioned cement plant, uh, Councilor Beauregard and Demeray brought forward the Calali section by the schools at Elizabeth mm -hmm. Street. So those um, sections, also a section on Berkeley um, at Chippewa that there's a concern. So the, we have a number of locations where the speeds have been brought up and the concerns by council. So we are hoping that in that study, we will have recommendations from the traffic engineers as to exactly what we should be doing, or even if there should be a difference in the actual speed through the entire city in certain areas, specific to parks or uh, schools of that nature. Do we have a date when we can expect that report? Um, the report should be coming to council with a recommendation to hire, I would think by sometime in either late June or early July, once we get uh, feedback from the consultants and then some pricing on quotations that we're out for. Thank you. Thank you very much. And my last one is not really a question. It, it, well, it is in a way, actually, Councilor Bruno just brought this up regarding the um, grants. And this is about some of the things that have been put off in the city this year. And I guess this came through as a suggestion. And I thought it was kind of a great suggestion. Maybe we're already doing this. But um, the fact that we, we aren't doing some of the things that we're doing, such as the lighthouse tours, um, suggestion came forward that perhaps we should be doing virtual tours, lighthouse tours, putting them online on our website to show people to increase people, you know, interest in the town for next year, things that we could be doing. I, th I thought about we, we could do the lighthouse, we could also do the museum, we could do Arabella's tea room. We should be doing all kinds of virtual tours of these things and putting them out there so that, you know, we have that interest in the town when we get back to normal workings. Uh, I don't think it's a really costly piece to do. We've got some of these monies left from the grants and things. Perhaps that's where that money could go to do. And that was, that's all I had to say. Thank you. I don't know. I, I think I guess that would have to go through um, Economic Development Committee for that one, yeah. would it be? I'll, I'll pass it over to the uh, CAO. Sure. Okay, so, great. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Kalele, if I appreciate the uh, suggestion, I'll take it back to staff. Uh, my understanding is that the library has already been doing virtual readings and virtual programming. And mm -hmm. if the museum hasn't already, that is definitely in the works. Uh, Councillor Beauregard, who's a museum board member, might be able to report on that. But uh, the museum was scheduled to open very recently. So it wasn't, in fact, um, closed. It was already closed in the wintertime, so the pandemic didn't affect the initial. Right. It didn't close because of the pandemic. It opened later because of the pandemic but they do have plans for virtual exhibits. And I will take the other ones back to staff, ECDEV staff and so on. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor. Just, just a clarification, it's Stanley Street, Stanley Avenues in Niagara Falls, and it's Lakeshore Road West and Cement Plant Road, just for those yep. that are watching uh, so they understand what we're talking about. So the Stanley uh, Street area is in the new section uh, at the west end of Stanley uh, near or at Wood Lane, which uh, Mr. Lee said. But I just wanted to clarify that it is Lakeshore Road West, not Lakeshore Road East. My apologies. Yeah, no I problem. said East. Yeah. yeah, no, I know. That's why I just wanted to clarify that. Okay. Uh, next is Councillor Demery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do have a few items, and I hope that my, my uh, connection doesn't fail on me while during these. But uh, first is uh, the, the amount of fireworks that were being let off over this past weekend. Um, I know that they shouldn't have been, but they were. Um, and there was really no way of uh, reporting them unless you actually saw the location they were being shot from. We could certainly hear them. Most of them were little firecrackers, not so much the, the visual displays. 
those are really a problem. And I would really like us to consider banning the sale of those. But uh, in any case, that's just, I just want to put that on everybody's radar. I don't know how everybody feels about those. Um, another thing is ro with road closures right now, a lot of people are, are depending on deliveries. I'm going to use Davis Street as an example. A lot of my neighbors have been complaining to me that we've shut our uh, the road down. The road is shut down. One block of it is shut down. But it's the through block that runs uh, off of Durham, which is where everybody comes in from. If you're following any, any kind of um, geo mapping, that's where you're coming through. Um, as a result, those orders from Amazon, from you know Costco, from various places are not arriving. The the businesses are not that the uh, trucks are not delivering because the road's closed. It says the road is closed. So I, I've been calling them and saying you know you can reroute them and come through the south end, but they're they're not they're not really paying attention. We got one delivery through, but the neighbors are really quite upset. They said especially now during the time of COVID, a lot of people are depending on on ordering. So. That, that's a problem. I don't know if there's something we can do about it or not, but um, if there is something, I would appreciate that uh, that could be looked into. So that's another one. Uh, Christy, um, another one is transit. Mm. I've got a, a quite a few people uh, approaching me saying that they're really having a, a great issue doing things like groceries, that sort of thing, because there's no transit available. So it's a bit of a problem for them. And mm -hmm. I know that um, there, are, there are lots of ways for them to get groceries, but it is difficult without the transit. I'm just wondering if there's any uh, word at all on when Welland Transit's going to come back up. I, I know the people in Welland are really upset about it as well. So uh, I don't know if there's anything there, but uh, transit would certainly be another one. Um, Scott, um, I'll let Scott so, answer that one. Okay. Scott, on the transit. Sure. So through your worship to Councillor Demery, I'm not sure as you're going through these things rapid fire. Sorry. If you yeah. want us a, an answer on fireworks, the chief is still on the call. If you want an answer on Davis Street, Chris Lee is still on the call. Uh, transit specifically, and I think council knows some of this, so we were, uh, I don't know how to put it, it was well in transit's decision to stop the service. Yes. We were consulted. We did say we will follow your lead. Um, so I can't say that it was beyond our control completely. That's not a factual statement, but it was ultimately their recommendation to the city as well as well in city council to stop both services the caveat is that they put an alternate service in place in Welland and they did not do that in, in, in Port Colborne. But I want to put it in context for council and I think council is generally aware of this, but a reminder, we're paying about $1,000 a day for the bus, the community bus that is. At the time that it was taken off the road, there was about 25 trips, which is about 12 and a half people taking a two-way trip. And, and it is a financial decision and I'm sorry if that sounds insensitive, I'm sorry if that doesn't sound compassionate, but 12 and a half people for $1,000 a day. Again, the money to recover from the pandemic has to come from somewhere. So it's something that we could ramp back up if we felt the demand was there. I can say that my office received exactly one call. I don't know if City Hall got more calls than that, but I had one person call City Hall and that particular individual was somewhat passionate about the issue but said that he had made alternate arrangements and they were fine, but he was worried about other people. So that's where we sit today with transit. Okay, thank you very much. I, I have been able to try to make some arrangements for a few of the others as well. So there's still a couple that are without, but um, I don't see it as a, a, a really large issue either yet. So um, I just wanted to, to have your take on that. Um, going back to the closed road though, if Mr. Lee is, is still on the call, um, Chris, is there anything that we could do to, to maybe help that out? Chris? Through you, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Demeray. Um, I was by there actually at uh, about 4.30 this afternoon and the road was opened again on Davis Street. Yeah. Um, just as a, a, a notation on it, that road closure was done by Canadian Niagara Power and that's the new power feed to the Ontario Hydro feed it's the secondary feed to Port Colbert. So that's what that closure was about. So it's to install that high voltage underground ductwork. Yeah. And uh, they were closed down a little bit yesterday and then all of today up until about four o'clock. So as of four o'clock today, that structure has been temporarily filled so that tracks and vehicles can traverse that roadway. Thank, thank you, Chris. They've been closing every day for about five days now, I believe. Uh, but they do, by, by about four o'clock, they open it up again. 
but by then it's too late. The deliveries come through earlier in the day. So it's just a matter of accommodating deliveries. But what I was really thinking of is if possibly we could put some signs to reroute uh, deliveries. But uh, if, if it can be done, I would appreciate it. If not, well, then it can't. Um, that's fine. But uh, I do thank you for that. And uh, if Council, the chief before is you on, move on, yeah. just before uh -huh. you move on, Chris, can we make sure that we speak with uh, Canadian Niagara Power and if we can help with detour signs to take people up, uh, as the councillor said, up the next street over and down uh, towards yeah, the see. south end of, of, uh, of Davis and then coming back up that way. If we could um, find out exactly when they're going to be finished there and if they're going to be closing for full days uh, moving forward. Can we? To you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, we can definitely touch out, touch base with uh, CNP on that. Um, I had actually intended to when I'd heard about this earlier, but when I came through at about 4.30, it was already open, so um, that being said, I didn't stop and talk to the, the people that was cleaning up. But I'll, I'll talk to the uh, supervisors at CNP and uh, pass on the message so that the, they can at least try to accommodate some of the local traffic um, if it's safe to do so. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Th thank you very much. I, I do appreciate that. And by all means, don't get CNP to slow down because we're really happy that it's happening. So <laughs> it, it's good that it's being done. Yes. Uh, okay. So uh, just to move on a couple of other things. Um, I just want to thank everybody that finally got the fishing open. I, I don't think I ever had more calls than on that matter alone. People wanting to go fishing at the lagoon. So I, I was really glad that that is done now. Um, the only other call that I'm getting a lot of is about the market, uh, the market square and when and how that may open. A lot of criticism of that other, other communities have got theirs open and we haven't got ours. My answer has been, as it is always, we can do it quickly or we can do it safely. You pick. So that, that's what I've been telling people. But at this point, um, possibly Scott could speak to when we may be able to see the market opening. Yeah. Scott? So through your worship to Councillor Demery, and I do appreciate you sharing that message publicly. As I said earlier today in my remarks about the, the city's response to the pandemic, if we have a choice between rapid and safe, we're going to choose safe every time. Um, staff are looking at the farmer's market. We're actively working with public health who is the recommending body for precautions being put in place. The precautions that they require are pretty strict. Um, to list a few, this isn't all of them, we're looking at hand sanitizer at every booth. We're looking at hand washing stations with water, which as you know, we don't have in the market square. We're looking at fencing the entire um, perimeter of the market and having one entrance and one exit at opposite ends. Uh, as you know, we have one staff person in the market, and again, this gets back to level of service. We're looking at counting people as they come in, counting people as they leave, and limiting the number of people that are in at once, and, and that takes staff. And I, we're, we're, at, we're at a bare bones crew to begin with on the city's staff, and if this would require parks workers to get out of parks and stop mowing lawn and emptying garbage and come to the uh, farmer's market. Uh, we've looked at... And, and still are actively looking at other locations. One of the reasons is that some of these, and there are many municipalities in Niagara that are not opening their market at all or substantially delayed opening. There are some that have very specific market buildings that the built environment allows them to open a little bit easier. Uh, ours is wide open and it's gonna require some controls in place. And we have looked at possibly moving to the Health and Wellness Center parking lot. We've looked at possibly moving to the, uh, to the road, that parking lot that rings around H.H. Knoll. But uh, I think we'll end up opening at least for harvest season, if not earlier. And we're trying for earlier, absolutely. I can assure you staff is trying for earlier with precautions in place that are approved by public health. So I can probably get an announcement to council in the early part of June. And that will come from the Parks and Rec well, Community and Economic Development because they Parks, uh, sorry, market is under their umbrella. So if you'll bear with me for two to three weeks, we'll get an announcement about opening. Okay, I thank you very much for that. Great, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Dan? That's everything I have. Okay, thank you. Councillor Dan, anything? Yeah, normally I don't have a whole lot to say, but tonight I do have a, a, a couple of concerns here. Um, Walking down Main Street there, along the weir and whatnot, uh, I don't know if that's uh, rail property or seaway property, but the grass, I, I don't think it's been touched yet this year. So, I mean, it's, it's fairly long. It needs to be trimmed. 
there's a bunch of garbage laying around that's been there for months. So anyways, if we can get, maybe get in touch with somebody or have a truck drive by and uh, we can get the right people on board there to uh, maybe uh, clean that up. Um, uh, before we move on, Mr. Lee, can you comment on that one? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Danch. Uh, specifically, which section along the weir are you referring to, Frank? So I'm on the uh, I'm on the west side, before the bridge. Obviously, I'm looking at, to the to the uh, to the south. The, the grass is huge. Um, there's a that, yeah, and uh, there's a fiberglass insulation bag, and it's been there for at least four or five months. And eventually, it's going to make its way down into the uh, to the weir. You know, I, I go for my morning walks and whatnot, uh, and I pick up garbage when I walk. But this has just been there for months, so somebody's got to get off there and uh, get down there. And I don't know if it's a seaway thing because it's on close to the weir, or is it a rail thing because it's close to the rail line? Either way, somebody's got to get down there and do some cleaning up. Okay, if you wouldn't mind, Chris. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Dench. Um, as far as the grass cutting goes, we can do what we can in there and picking up the garbage. Some of that section, as you as you said, is uh, seaway properties, but uh, anything that abuts the railroad, we can definitely uh, uh, deal with that situation. Yeah, and I know it's not all our problem because we, we like to uh, pass the buck here like everybody else, but uh, it's just it's something that needs to be done. Um, so the old sunbeam shoe. Oh, just on that, um, just hold it, Frank. Just on that right. issue. Um, to be quite honest, we don't pass the buck here. I'm going to call you out on that one, only because I've always made the comment to our staff, whether it's municipal or um, Ministry of Transportation property, Seaway property, rail lands. If it's not ours and we're not getting anywhere with those agencies, uh, our staff will go in and do things. I, as mayor, will go and deal with those organizations as uh needs to be done um i've made it very clear that we will not put up with their shenanigans as far as not cutting their grass picking up their garbage so our staff knows that so we will give direction through myself and through scott to have those areas looked at so i can assure you that chris will have this area looked at this week through his staff um, whatever needs to be cleaned up or cut it will get done and then uh both scott and i will deal with the, the two agencies that uh, we believe that are part of this and one is being Good. is the seaway so i just i just want to make sure you guys know that and i've made that clear since day one is being elected yeah. um, I, I i don't want to get too knobby but it's kind of like fixing the train tracks on uh, sugarloaf fade it's been going on for too long I, i'm going to move along here because uh it's getting late um ralph's got the old sunbeam shoe a car came off the road there a couple months back um hit the building did did some pretty serious damage to the building. Um, I know we've got some of those bolliards kick, kicking around and uh, Ralph is asking me if maybe we could put something along the pine trees and whatnot. And I'm, I'm sure there's a ton of wiring underground there and uh, all that kind of stuff. But all I can do is ask um, a little bit of protection for the building. Uh, it, it's not repaired yet. Um, I've got a video on my cameras at the store. I picked up the whole thing and it's just incredible to watch. So uh, maybe we can touch base with Ralph and say yay or nay to that. I know we've got a regional road there that we're dealing with, and we've got a city road, but it, it was quite the thing there. The guy put the car between the pole and the building, um, certainly damaging uh, everything that was around. But if we could take a look at that or talk to Ralph and say yay or nay to that, I, I would appreciate that. I'll give that one to the CAO. Through your worship to Councillor Danch, I recall you sending an email and a photo, oh gosh, a few weeks ago. Um, and I think the reply at the time was that the repair, the repair work that wasn't yet done was regional. The bollards themselves or the blockers to, uh, to, to offer some protection. I'll circle back with staff and see if that's uh, something that we can do or something we can get the region to actually do and come through with. I will follow up on it. I can't say for sure that it's a city responsibility, and I don't mean to pass the buck, but uh, we'll uh, we'll talk about it tomorrow on our director's agenda. Yeah, and, and I appreciate that, Scott. I mean, I don't think the bulliards would have stopped the car, but if it was a safety issue and somebody was walking on the street, it might have bounced them back the other way. But I, I do appreciate your interest there, and 
if you could forward it. And uh, the last thing uh, for me, end of Barrick Road, um, on the west end of the city, down at the bottom there, Gary at Fay Farms was uh, saying something to me about the lights been out for uh, ever. And if uh, we could just have a peek at that, uh, obviously the lights are ours and he's been complaining to me and I apologize. I didn't bring this forward sooner. Uh, and that's all I've got to say for this week. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dench. Councillor Bruno. Uh, yes, Your Worship. Just one thing. Uh, can a constituent, uh, that was a really good idea, remind me of all our frontline non-medical workers. So we always recognize uh, hospital staff, nurses, doctors, that. But, um, the suggestion was that whether it's in the import news, if we have, you know, some space to fill it, that perhaps we could uh, send a shout out and a salute to service workers that have been taking care of all of us during COVID. Um, they're usually service workers, um, minimum wage people, right? A lot of them are, uh, are, are women in the workplace. And those people don't, I think, get the kind of credit that we don't, there have been deemed essential services and they're doing the groceries at the grocery store and, uh, you know, the taxi cab driver, the waste management people, all those people. I, I think it would be a nice gesture uh, if we could put something out thanking them. And, I, and she was this the lady was thinking about uh, our um, our city city hall news that's in the that's in the leader. So I just wondering if there's any space there, if uh, Michelle might be able to to work on something and uh, few heads together and some some nice thank yous to those folks. Uh, Councillor uh, Scott and senior staff will look after that. Great. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No issues, but just a statement. Um, I think uh, Harry and I have been working uh, with staff on on a few issues and I just like to comment uh, how well staff's doing through this and solving uh, problems and getting on things. And uh, certainly I'm satisfied. And I think Councillor Wells has had some results from, uh, from things he's dealt with with staff. So I'd just like to say thank you very much to staff and uh, keep up the good work. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Bodner. Councillor Beauregard? Yes, Your Worship. Uh, to or uh, to Chris, actually, um, when might I, the report be coming um, regarding the gates at, at the end of Johnson Street that we spoke about, I believe, at last meeting? Mr. Lee? To you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Beauregard. Um, the issue with the gates is um, we are looking at addressing the gates at the ends of all of the roads along the lake as well as the one that you had mentioned at the end of Johnson Street, which accesses the trail. So those are all access issues, and we wanted to have public meetings to get input from the, the public within the neighborhood. That being said, COVID is making it difficult for us to have those meetings and get public input. So I've tasked staff with the process and seeing if we can get it to a certain point so that if and when they open up and we can start to have public meetings of some sort, then we can have those meetings, get the input from the public, get those concerns brought forward, and then bring a report to council with recommendations based on that public input. Uh, that's basically where it stands at this point in time. Thank you, Councillor. So just if I understand correctly, we're, we're kind of just delayed for a little bit until we, we can get a public process going. Is that what you're saying? That, that's correct. That's, our, that's the way we're looking at it with staff right now. Um, we want to include the public in that process with consultation. Um, specifically along the, the lakeshore, there's been some of the residents have been very vocal. Um, that being said, uh, there's not as many in the Johnson Street area, but that doesn't mean that uh, they all have an opinion on the situation. And so we wanted to include them in that process so that they feel like they're part of it and part of the solution. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Is that it? Uh, one more item, actually. Uh, the old bakery on Mitchell Street, uh, this one's pertaining mostly to bylaw and maybe fire as well. There are, I've received complaints about potential squatters or squatters being in there. So it uh, seems to be pretty well abandoned and there's people taking advantage of it. 
Go ahead, Scott. Yeah, through your worship to Councilor Beauregard, I'll take that back to staff uh, immediately. I'll send an email now. Uh, those kind of inquiries for any member of council, as you get them, please send them in. There's no need to save those for a council meeting. It's the kind of thing that staff, if they get them, that we can involve either bylaw if that's required, NRP if that's required, or even a regional homeless worker or an outreach worker who will help get people into the housing they need if that's what's required. So absolutely not the kind of thing that needs to wait for a Monday night. Uh, the kind of thing that I can get, whether you report it to me or to bylaw, I can get staff working on right away. So thank you for bringing it to my attention and I'll, I'll get that first thing in the morning. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Baggett. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Boy, there's a lot of bees in this council. Uh, one comment first. Um, there's a little local group that started up in Port Colbert and they've gone national over the, the weeks and weeks. And uh, I think uh, they're doing a great job. They're uh, making these call, things called mass mates. And uh, they've donated many to the our hospital in Northland Point and different uh, community centers, community living. And uh, I just want to give a shout out to them. And uh, they've also asked if the city would we, would need any of those mass mates. They're the little knitted or crochets things that go in the back with buttons that your your mask hooks on to. But uh, they've offered the city library museum. If you need any, just give them a ding. They're on Facebook and uh, they'd be happy to give some over. I did tell them about the food truck once she made the announcement that uh, contact Port Cares and maybe they could uh, tie something in with it too. So for our food giveaway. Uh, the other thing is, uh, actually, it's pretty well covered. The uh, railway track crossing, that's fine. The other one was the uh, garbage cans on the weekends. Uh, I did talk to uh, Ashley. Today, she called me up. <clears throat> and we had a discussion about it, but uh, since Councilor clearly brought up to the city, oh, I don't want to circumvent his position. So I'll, I'll leave that with him. And uh, he can uh, deal with it. That's all I got. Thank you, Councillor. Perfect. Okay, moving on. Minutes of boards, commissions, and committees. There are none this evening. Now on to consideration of bylaws. Madam Clerk, are there any bylaws this evening? Uh, there are four bylaws this evening. Uh, the fifth one, which was the uh, parking amendment, has been uh, removed and will be brought forward to the next meeting with the amendments that were made. Uh, so the renumbering is 6781-30-20 to 6784-34-20. Thank you, Madam uh, Clerk. We have Councillor Bodner uh, moving that. Seconder is Councillor Wells. Any questions to any of the bylaws? Seeing none, please raise your hand in favor. That is unanimous, thank you. Before we adjourn, I would just like to thank everyone for watching tonight's council meeting. The next council meeting will be held on June the 8th. Please stay uh, safe during this time, and the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, councillors.